All right, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us tonight on this uh, town hall for the Columbia River Treaty. My name is Brooke McMurchie and I work with the province of British Columbia's Columbia River Treaty team and I'll be your facilitator for tonight. Just in case there's any questions, this is a picture of the lovely headwaters of the Columbia River behind me here. It's so great to see many of you online uh, because we are running this session be, by Zoom webinar. Uh, you all won't be able to see the list of attendees, but I can see the number ticking up uh, and we've got about 125 so far and that number is rising. So there's lots of you out there listening in. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I am sure that there are folks from both sides of the Canada-US border joining us. Uh, there's likely folks from the Columbia Basin uh, and elected officials. Um, there may be some folks from the Indigenous communities. And no matter where you're, you're joining us from, pardon me, from, uh, we thank you very much for taking the time tonight. And on that note, since many of us are joining from different locations, we want to acknowledge with respect and gratitude the traditional territories of the Indigenous nations across BC and beyond. Uh, especially those whose territories are in the Columbia Basin. So this is our second public Zoom session. And though we've done everything we can to ensure that the session runs smoothly, uh, as I'm sure everybody has experienced, there may be some technical glitches. If there are, we ask for your patience in advance as we work them out. We are definitely open to any and all feedback on this session. You can email it to us at Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca, or you can fill out the survey that will become available to you after this session. Uh, if it's not emailed to you automatically, then you can find it on our website. We'll be posting a link to it there. You may notice that we are recording this session for tonight and we'll be posting it on YouTube after the fact. So for those who are not able to join us right now, they'll be able to listen in another time. So at this point, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our esteemed panel of speakers for this evening and invite them to turn their video on and give a little wave as I, as I mentioned their name. So we uh, will start the evening off with a few words from our uh, BC minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty, Minister Katrina Conroy, welcome. Uh, we have Sylvain Fabi, who is Canada's chief negotiator for the Columbia River Treaty. Welcome, Sylvain. Thank you. Kathy Eichenberger is joining us as BC's lead on the Columbia River Treaty negotiating team. Nathan Matthew is representing the Shkwetmik Nation on the Canadian negotiating delegation. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, Jay Johnson is also on the line. Jay is representing the Silks Okanagan Nation on the Columbia River Treaty Negotiating Team. Uh, we also have Bill Green, who is representing the Tanaha Nation on the Columbia River Treaty Negotiating Team. We also have Linda Worley and Cindy Pierce, both from the uh, Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee. Linda is the chair and Cindy is executive director. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers tonight. Uh, but before we dive in, I want to take a little bit of time to explain the process. Um, we, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll hear from Minister Conroy shortly, and then we'll hear from Nathan Matthew to say a few words to start us off for the evening. We'll then move into the panelist session uh, where we will hear an update from each of the panelists and they will also be able to answer some of the questions that we received in advance of this session. So thank you very much to those who submitted questions. Uh, we'll be addressing those throughout the session. If you have questions that you want to ask during the session, uh, you can do so two ways. You can either type them into the Q&A box. You should see a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. You can type in your question there and there will be a choice to submit it anonymously if you'd like. Uh, and another way to ask a question is to use the raise hand function. Uh, for some of you, it might be at the bottom of the screen. Others, it might be um, tucked into the right hand, bottom right hand corner of your participants list, or not the participants list, sorry, the, the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, in, in both cases with the Q&A function and the raise hand function, we're going to 
address those questions at the end of the panelist session. So we're going to spend the first bit answering the questions that we received in advance. And then after that, we'll be able to answer the questions that you type in and we'll be able to let folks who have their hands raised speak a little bit. We are going to try our very best to answer as many questions as we can tonight. We have just over two hours here and uh, we are prepared to stay a bit longer if we need to. Any questions that we're not able to answer tonight will be included in a summary report that we'll be posting on our website afterwards. So I guess one more thing to say about uh, asking questions when you've raised your hand, uh, please try and keep your questions succinct in the interest of time and, and out of respect for others who may want to ask questions. Uh, and also please keep um, in mind having some respect for the folks who you're asking questions of. Uh, and finally, if, if possible, try to not ask questions that have already been asked. So Sometimes it's useful to have a little bit of a reminder of exactly what it is we're talking about. Uh, so wanted to share that the Columbia River Treaty for those who might be new to it is an agreement between Canada and the United States ratified in 1964 for the purpose of reducing flood risk along the Columbia River and increasing hydropower generation. Under the Columbia River Treaty, Canada was able to build three dams the Duncan Dam, which created the Duncan Reservoir, the Hukili Side Dam, which created the Arrow Lakes Reservoir, and the Mica Dam, which created the Kimbasket Reservoir. The treaty also allowed the United States to build Libby Dam in Montana, which many of you may know created the Kukunusa Reservoir, which crosses the border and extends into Southeast BC. The treaty has no end date. Contrary to what some people may think, uh, the treaty can go on forever. It's an evergreen treaty. However, the flight control management portion uh, ends in 2024 and it changes from an assured flood control to a more ad hoc regime called called upon. 2024 is also the first year that either country could issue a termination notice providing 10 years written notices given. So because of the importance of that date of that year, both countries in 2011 to 2013 did a review of the treaty to figure out if it was uh, worth continuing, if it should be terminated, or if there were changes that could be made to it. And both saw value in the treaty, but certainly saw room for improvement. So in 2018, Canada and the US began negotiations to modernize the treaty. While the treaty has definitely brought benefits to both countries, it's also brought impacts, in particular to the BC portion of the Columbia Basin. And in addition, when the treaty was first signed, there was uh, little to no consultation with in Indigenous nations or basin communities. Since the province in particular has started to look at the treaty again in 2011, we've committed to engaging with Indigenous nations and basin local governments uh, and communities to make sure that a modernized treaty reflects their needs. So that's a very, very short condensed version of kind of what's brought us here today. If you're interested in learning more, we invite you to go to the uh, province's Columbia River Treaty website. There's lots of information there. Uh, but now I would love to, to pass the mic over to Minister Katrina Conroy, who will say a few words to kick us off this evening. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Brooke, and, and good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to say a few words to kick off tonight's event. And in the past, as the provincial minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty, I've had the pr privilege of joining many of you at the meetings in your own communities. And that's just not possible in the current situation. But I'm really grateful to have this chance to speak to you rem remotely from my home just outside of Castlegar on the traditional territory of the Columbia Basin Indigenous Nations who call this land home. Um, last November, I was sworn in as BC's new Minister of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, and I was also really honoured to have the Premier ask me to return to my role as Minister Responsible for the Columbia Basin Trust, the Columbia Power Corporation and the Columbia River Treaty, things that we like to call all things Columbia. So as many of you probably know, I'm, I'm a long time resident of the Columbia Basin and, and I understand what the Columbia River Treaty means 
means to people in this region. I, I know very well the history and the effects on the lives, the livelihoods and, and the cultures of the people here in the basin. I, I grew up here as, as a kid. I remember seeing houses being moved, the, the basin being flooded, but hearing those stories from people who were profoundly affected and, and it, it stayed with me for, for many, many years. And I, I also understand the opportunity we have today to make changes and, and, and to move forward much more inclusively and, and with greater awareness of things that were just not considered when the treaty was first created. And, and doing that means engaging with those who are affected by the treaty and in particular the Indigenous nations and, and community residents right across the Columbia Basin. It, it means connecting with you as, as we're doing today and because we, we haven't been able to hold in-team person community meetings over the past year, our provincial treaty team felt it was really important to connect virtually with Basin residents and, and anyone else who has an interest in, in the treaty. And tonight you will hear the latest updates from our Canadian negotiators, the Indigenous Nations representatives and, and local governments who are involved in the process to modernize the, the treaty. And you'll also have a chance to ask questions as has as, as been said, as Brooke has said. And, and I just, I wanna take this moment though to, to thank all those folks for the incredible work they are all doing on our behalf. You know, um, Sylvan and Kathy, as you you know, you lead our, our negotiating team and are doing an incredible job. The uh, representatives from the Indigenous nations who have just added such a, a wealth of information, really valuable information to the, the process and to the negotiations and to the local governments committee who are, are really involved in, in, in the process and, and who have made sure that um, people from the municipalities, the local governments from right throughout the base and have had their voices heard and, and you've done an incredible job with that. So again, thank you to all of you for the, the incredible work that you've done. And in addition, you're also going to hear about work that is happening outside of the Canada-US negotiations to seek improvements throughout the base and really important improvements. Because whatever is happening at any given time in terms of negotiations, there, there's always important work that the province, Canada and Indigenous nations can do to address con concerns, the many concerns related to the treaty. And I, I just want to end by thanking everyone who has logged on to the Zoom. When I last looked, Brooke, it was at 100 and almost 200. It was at 195, I think. So there's people really care about this issue. They're, they're passionate about it. And, and so again, thank you to all of you who've logged into Zoom or, or phoned in to be part of the meeting. And, and those of you who sent questions in advance or will ask questions this evening and, and those who just want to listen and learn more, your commitment and engagement is, is what makes this process meaningful. And our government is doing all we can to engage and, and to listen in a way that, that just didn't happen when the treaty took effect more than half a century ago. But our efforts, it wouldn't mean much with, without your engagement. So thank you again for taking part. And I know you're all looking forward to tonight's discussions. I know it's gonna be good. So thank you. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you so much, Minister. That was great. And now Nathan Matthew, I'd like to invite you to say a few words uh, before we move into the panelists. Hi, Nathan. Hi, uh, Wyatt. Uh, good evening, hello. Uh, it is uh, really great to be here and uh, honored to welcome individuals in our way to, uh, to this session. Usually we're face-to-face, person-to-person, and uh, things are, we're, we welcome, welcome people to a, a particular physical space. And, uh, but tonight, of course, like a lot of things lately, is we're doing it virtually. So it's, a, it's, it's my honor you to, my honor to welcome you virtually to this, this session. And uh, we trust that uh, we recognize that the, these discussions are uh, with respect to the, to the Columbia River Basin, uh, which uh, is situated on the lands of the Tanaka, the Sequem, and the Silks people. And uh, we're so pleased to participate in events like this, where we share information, uh, develop uh, knowledge and, and understanding of the, the, the Columbia River and how together we can work in a good way to make a better place for, for humans and, and uh, our environment and, and all of the species in, in the uh, 
Columbia Basin and work together to make the strongest possible uh, case position that can be placed on the Canada, United States, uh, Columbia River Treaty negotiations. So, uh, and uh, so much of this work is, is important in doing that without, without input from people that uh, are impacted by the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, uh, it's very, very difficult to carry on this, this task. So virtually, welcome to the evening. Thank you very much, Nathan. How, how very true. So now we can, we'll start with our panelists uh, with Sylvain Fabi, who is the chief negotiator for Canada's Columbia River Treaty team. Sylvain, I'll pass it on to you to share an update on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brooke. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, can, can you see me well? Because I, I can't see myself. Yes, we can see you just fine. Ah, perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. It worked. Now I can see. You. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Great to, to meet with you this evening. And uh, as uh, people before me have said, albeit vir virtually, um, it's certainly better than a phone call. Uh, I, I've done a lot of these uh, in the last months. And, uh, and, you know, I think we've managed to make uh, these meetings work as, as well as we want. And uh, I hope all of you, of course, and your loved ones and your families are keeping safe and healthy. And uh, as we continue to cope with the second and even perhaps an eventual third wave of this pandemic across Canada and in the US where I'm located now and, and indeed around the globe. So, and, and a big thanks to Minister Conroy. You know, thank you for your consistent support for this long process to, to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, we're so pleased that uh, I, we, as 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 a members of the team, but but I, as the chief negotiator, so very pleased that uh, you are continuing to be the minister responsible for the CRT. That I, I felt really good that day when uh, when Kathy told me, and thank you Nathan for your your words of of welcome for us all and 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 mentioning the importance of these meetings. Uh, uh, you you always have something uh, pertinent to say, and and, and tonight again uh, is no exception. So, but but I'd like to begin um, um, by introducing my team, uh, who are staying up late for that for us tonight in uh, in cold and and snowy Ottawa. Many of you may be familiar with them, but some of you may not. Uh, they have been involved in community consultations sessions before that took place around the basin, for example, in the fall of 2019. So we have Stephen Gluck, who is uh, my deputy director for the Columbia River Treaty Unit, and Lynn Panaya, who is the senior advisor working on uh, that negotiating team. So I'm, I'm very happy that, that they're there. Um, and the next issue I'd like to raise is that many of you may know by now is I have now assumed the role of Consul General of Canada at our consulate in Denver, Colorado. Um, Denver covers not only Colorado, but, but a swath of states in the U.S. Mountain West, including Montana, Utah, uh, Wyoming, and Kansas. So I'd like to make clear that my new responsibilities uh, will complement the work of the Columbia River Treaty negotiation process. Um, I remain the CRT Chief Negotiator for Canada, and in fact, I look forward to being geographically closer to the action, uh, so to speak, and uh, hopefully being closer at the same time to all of you geographically will also mean that I can visit the basin uh, often and sometimes at least in the near future whenever it's safer to do so. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise with you is that right now we, we're at the juncture of, of a new and exciting moment in Canada-US bilateral relations. Yesterday, all of you uh, probably uh, know by now that yesterday, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden held their, their first bilateral meeting as heads uh, of government. Uh, of course, it was like us, a virtual, a virtual visit. And uh, one of the things they agreed upon is 
what they call the roadmap for a renewed U.S. Canada partnership. And th this roadmap establishes a blueprint for a, quite an ambitious and whole of government effort against, uh, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, on, uh, on addressing climate change, on global health security, on defense and security, uh, and shared commitment to diversity, equity, and justice. A lot of people will say, ah, this roadmap is only words on paper. Well, I disagree. Uh, the first thing, uh, first is that this, and this is hard to disagree with, this uh, blueprint uh, sets a new a constructive and progressive tone to what is by Swiss Unifar our most important relationship. And, and also I can tell you that this roadmap for me as Consul General of Canada in, in, in Denver, that'll be my Bible for the next four years. It'll be the guiding light for everything I and all my colleagues in the federal government do with regards to our relationship with the United States. It's, it's very important. And, and I encourage people to, to read it. There were some good, some good overviews of, of that roadmap and it'll give you a pretty good idea of where both countries intend to go and to uh, grow our bilateral relationship. And of course, Given this renewed path, we can see that several elements of our bilateral relationships are becoming increasingly important, particularly on climate change and the environment. Of course, it's still early uh, and it remains to be seen how this renewed cooperation, this, this roadmap will impact the CRT negotiations. But I think we can safely say that it, it sets a, a good, uh, foundation for, uh, for, for a good path forward. Now, about the negotiations. Uh, many of you know that Canada hosted virtually again, the last round of the CRT negotiations, round 10 with the US, which was held from on June 29th and 30th, 2020, last year. And, and for that uh, round, um, Canada working as a team with BC and, and our Indigenous nation partners, uh, we developed and presented a proposal to the U.S. which is comprehensive and it covers, covers a wide range of CRT related issues, including those issues of priority to you, the Basin residents. Since our last round in June, uh, we haven't received any formal response nor indication from the U.S. on next steps, right? However, with the transition to the new administration and, and the time needed to get themselves prepared, uh, you know, for first to hold the election and then get, get themselves prepared, um, we expect that by now we will be in a position to proceed reasonably soon. I personally have kept in regular touch with the U.S. chief negotiator, my counterpart, and I know that the U.S. is keen, and they have said so publicly, to complete this treaty negotiation. So at this point, we are taking a wait and see approach, which doesn't mean, as you'll see later on during our session tonight, that we're sitting idle. Um, one thing I'd like to do now is briefly mention the range of issues being discussed in the negotiations and, and the topics that Canada included in its first comprehensive proposal, topics that we had raised before separately in the previous rounds. So in our proposal to the US, um, the, the comprehensive Canadian proposal covered um, a, a, a range of issue, including of course, the, the two key main issues of the existing treaty, which which remain important issues. Uh, that means flood risk management and power generation, but an issue that we've, we have been pushing really hard for in our work with the US, and it was included in our proposal, is a dimension on ecosystem function. And also we've included uh, in, in the themes that we want to uh, discuss and negotiate, 
is uh, the Libby coordination and, and uh, gaining a, a more uh, substantive role for Canada in that Libby Dam coordination. And another thing that we've presented to the US, and that's a very important um, uh, um, uh, element of our proposal, especially to address ecosystem functions, is we have included in our, our, our proposal increased flexibility for Canadian operations to address issues in Canada. So we, we, we want to gain a, a, an element, a part of flexibility that we can use for our own benefits without having to go to the US. For that. That's a very important and, and I would say novel element that, that we're discussing with the US. Um, so one last thing I wanted to say is I'm, 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 as the chief negotiator, I'm, I'm really pleased that the community remains active on the modernization process. I know things have been quiet for some time and will remain so for a little bit longer, but not too much. Um, and we all need some patience as, um, as we wait for the next steps that the US uh, is planning. But thank you for your continued commitment to keeping both myself and BC on track to getting the best possible agreement for Basin residents and for BC trying to extract as much as we can for your benefit uh, from this uh, treaty negotiation. So with that, uh, the, these are my um, comments that I wanted to make tonight, and, and I'll be happy to take your questions um, either now or once all our presentations are concluded. So back to you, Brooke. Thank you, Sylvain. And actually, we do have a question that was sent to us uh, before tonight that is related to negotiations. Somebody was hoping uh, to have some light shed on what the U.S. is hoping to see um, change in the treaty's terms and conditions. So wondering if you could speak to that at all, what the U.S. interests may be in the treaty negotiations. Okay, thanks. So it's good. It, it's kind of a little bit of a segue to what I've said, because I've mentioned just before now, mm -hmm. uh, the elements that we as Indigenous nations, BC and Canada want to have in, in the new treaty. Obviously, US interests, I will not surprise you when I say that um, flood risk management for them remains a, a very important issue. You know, like the main reason this treaty you know, was, was negotiated in the 1960s. One of the main reasons was to establish a regime that would um, avoid, uh, it does provide uh, flood risk uh, protection in Canada, but it was also to avoid um, flooding, a, a catastrophic flooding that happened. Uh, one of them in the 40s, if I'm not mistaken, flooding and, and completely erasing the city of, of Vanport. Uh, so they, they wanted to have a, um, uh, some sort of a, of a system, a regime that would help prevent these catastrophic flooding. This is still a big issue for them and we should not be surprised about that, right? Today, there's even more to protect in, in the US part of the basin from flood risk management than there was 60 years ago, right? So that was the first thing. Of course, the, um, uh, the uh, power electricity element uh, of the treaty is still important to the US. Uh, I can, this is one of the few things I can talk about publicly because they have made it themselves so public for the last, over the last years. They, we, we, they, they think they pay too much for their electricity. They've said so many times. So I, I'm not divulging any secret, which, which I would never do because there's always a, 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 an element of, of keeping the negotiations between ourselves as much as possible. But there is a desire for them to, to reduce what, what they uh, compensate Canada with in terms of, of uh, the power benefit that they get. Um, while the um, ecosystems and env environmental components uh, were, were put forward by Canada. I know that there's a there's that there, there is receptibility receptibility on on their part of this, and and frankly, 
if we just read the newspaper and based on what I just said about the um, the new roadmap that that the president and the prime minister agreed upon yesterday, uh, they, they the element of climate change and environmental protection are pretty upfront and important in that roadmap. So uh, you know a, a, addressing through that treaty some some environmental issues uh, could become more important to them than it was before based on what they've said uh, publicly. So uh, these are the key elements that that are important to uh, to the US of course and uh, and 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 these are not surprising because they've spoken about it um, extensively publicly. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Sylvain. That's great. So we do um, we do have a few more questions related to negotiations that have come in, but I think we'll move on to to Kathy first and hear from her, and then we'll circle back to some of the questions that have been asked after that. So, Kathy, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, today and, and Brooke, and thanks for everybody who's online. That's uh, hundreds of people. That's that's amazing. I'm very happy that people can join us and especially from the comfort of your home. Um, I was excited about this because it gives us a chance to hear from everyone across the basin. You know, I do miss uh, our, our annual series of community meetings where we go to 12, 13, 14 communities and see you face to face and, and nothing can replace that. But this is different and it's also exciting in a different way. And um, I also want to welcome uh, all the folks across the province who are interested in, in uh, the treaty. And I know there are many uh, who, could, who could join now and not through you know, physically in, in the past. And also a welcome to our friends uh, to the South in the United States. I recognize uh, area codes from Washington DC, from Portland. I'm glad to have everyone uh, share and listen into what people have to say. Um, I absolutely want to thank Minister Conroy for her long-standing dedication to improving the Columbia River Treaty. And, and I know she takes it to heart, having seen uh, the construction of the dams and the effects that it has. But I also want to really appreciate and thank the great support from her staff over many years. And a, a special shout out to Dina Brown, who's been marvelous and has been a real uh, community uh, contact for, for folks in the basin out of Castlegar to answer people's questions. Um, as Sylvain mentioned, you know, BC, Canada, the Tanakha Shikwapim and Silk Okanagan, we all worked really hard to collaborate on development of the first Canadian proposal, our initial proposal. Um, and, you know, despite the challenges of COVID-19, and that was new to us at the time, and we were, you know, this was March, we were coming back from DC, we were in lockdown, and we had to learn how to collaborate uh, through, through Zoom, uh, Skype, whatever. And, but, you know, it, we, we adapted. And hopefully it'll work again tonight. I already got kicked off. Uh, <laughs> my internet connection went down, even in Victoria. You don't have to be in Meadow Creek to lose your connectivity. Um, but anyway, we put a lot of, uh, a great deal of time and effort to make sure that this initial proposal, which everyone contributed to, was supported uh, by the representatives of all five governments. And, and that, in my, in my books, is a great accomplishment. Uh, and as Sylvain said, it was presented to U.S. delegation last June through a WebEx meeting. And uh, yeah, the virtual meeting, it, it was effective, but, you know, it doesn't, it can't replace being in the same room uh, with the delegations together and having the back and forth. And I really hope that we can reconvene together in person, the two delegations in, in 2021. Uh, some of the questions we received uh, prior to this town hall was uh, about the timelines and I just want to remind folks there's no definite timeline to complete the negotiations. On the other hand, we really do look forward to regaining and resuming the momentum that we had and, and making real progress. Um, and uh, people are curious about being notified for the next session of the next session. Um, 
as we've done through the first 10, each time there's a session, negotiating session that's planned, we make, we inform the public through our social media, et cetera, et cetera. So when there is a next session scheduled, then you will all be advised of it. Um, in the meantime, uh, we continue to collaborate with all of our partners to refine the best approach to seeking improvements uh, within the treaty. And, and even to address issues outside of the treaty uh, in, in domestic issues in the basin. And, and you'll be hearing a lot more of that uh, this evening. Uh, but one of the tools that we're using to inform the negotiations is, is this uh, an expanded modeling initiative. And, and so the, we have a negotiation advisory team that uh, in, is represented by all five levels of government, again, BC, Canada, Silk, uh, and and uh, this, this NAC, Negotiation Advisory Team, is working on an important project to examine the different scenarios on how the treaty dams uh, could be operated uh, to meet the basin interests. So a subgroup of, of the Negotiation Advisory Team, they're modeling the system operations, uh, the, the reservoir levels, the flows, to take into account all of the objectives uh, that are established for ecosystems, for indigenous cultural values, for flood risk management, for hydropower generation, and other social and economic values. And, and this Indigenous-led ecosystem function subcommittee uh, is developing those performance uh, measures for uh, ecosystem in particular and indigenous cultural values. And there are also a uh, part of that team, provincial and federal uh, agency technical staff, as well as an env environmental non-government organization scientist. They're all contributing to this work led by the indigenous nations. Um, but also uh, the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments uh, Committee is leading the development of performance measures uh, for socioeconomic interests, and, and they will tell you more about it later this evening. But uh, one of the things I want to make uh, sure people understand is this work is ongoing, uh, and but it is not delaying, it hasn't delayed, uh, currently not delaying, and will not delay the negotiations with the United States. This is all work that will contribute to not only informing the uh, treaty negotiations or, or the Canadian delegation, but over the longer term, when we implement adaptive management over time. Um, I've also received a question uh, about uh, a commitment uh, that we've made in the past. And I think there's another question about seeing the proposal. And, and the question was, uh, the BC government has previously committed to consulting with Basin residents before making final decisions on a modernized treaty. Do you have a sense of how much detail about pending international agreements you'll be able to share in this forthcoming consultation? So our commitment is that people of the basin will clearly understand what is in a modernized treaty that would be proposed before it's agreed to, before it's finalized. There will be no surprises, not like in 1961 and ratified in 64. Um, we, the US and Canada have tabled initial proposals. Obviously in a negotiation, we don't share each iteration publicly, that, that is confidential to negotiations. But prior to uh, the, the uh, uh, when, once we get closer to a, a, an area, a range of agreement, a zone of agreement, we will be coming to the, the basin uh, to share with you the progress that we've made. And we did that in 2013, when we prepared a recommendations for cabinet on the future of the treaty. And, and at that time we consulted broadly within the basin. So we commit to doing no less for uh, a modernized treaty. Um, now, switching gears a little bit uh, on from the negotiations, uh, one of the things that people have asked about is whether indigenous nations local uh, elected officials, basin residents, will you have, will they all have a voice in the future decisions regarding treaty planning and operations? In fact, one of the questions that we got uh, prior to this town hall was, um, it was been widely suggested that accompanying governance reforms to treaty entities and committees that implement the treaty are needed. 
Can you share any information about what the governance structure of a modernized treaty might look like? How does uh, the need for reconciliation with indigenous peoples influence this? What kind of mechanisms for public engagement uh, will the modernized governance system include? So I want to thank uh, Graham for that question. Um, it's a very, very timely question because the NAT, which includes again, the representatives of the five governments has have directed that a consultant be hired to look at potential uh, governance options, different governance models for a modernized treaty. And um, to be clear, this is for the Canadian domestic uh, CRT governance on how decisions that are made in Canada feed into the, the treaty planning and operating processes. So this, this process was just kicked off this week and the NAT Governance Steering Committee is working with the consultant group to refine the process and, and the work plan. And, but I can confirm uh, that one of the fundamental principles underlying this process is that the uh, proposed governance models will be consist consistent with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, what I can say right now is that the process will be rolling out in stages and it will take time. Uh, we want this to be a collaborative process. And as we do that, we'll be consulting with, of course, Indigenous Nations, uh, Columbia Retreaty Local Governments Committee, uh, Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, and we will be transparent. And I know people are chopping at the bit to know more. We will provide more information in the near future. So lastly, I want to talk just very briefly about some of the projects that the Columbia River Treaty team is working on to address um, issues, interests, uh, related to the treaty, but are not the subject of the negotiations. Um, and these, these issues and these interests have been raised, you know, by the Basin residents over the last oh, many, many, quite a few, many years. Um, so even while the discussions with the U.S. are ongoing, there's a number of these, these projects that we are wanting to move forward with and, and, and addressing. And right now we have about 12 on the go. Some are specific to communities like the Cusp, Vale Mount, Creston, and others looking at benefiting the whole basin. And I'll just give you a few. I want to, otherwise, it would take the whole evening. Um, one of the key messages we heard uh, throughout the num last number of years is the need to acknowledge what was lost and to enhance what remains. And so during uh, the 2019 community meetings, we shared one way to make an acknowledge that acknowledgement. Um, and that's the Columbia River Treaty Heritage Project. And that is a proposed touring route uh, linking a series of information stops at key locations uh, throughout the Columbia Basin. Uh, this is a community driven initiative that's being guided by a steering committee with representation across the basin. This is not a BC government top down thing. This is the, a, a grassroots thing. And we've secured funding for the first phase and the engagement uh, and having an engaged an implementation team to move it forward. And so the stories for this project, for these key locations, these stories will come from the basin communities, indigenous and non-indigenous, and the community engagement is expected to begin in, in late spring and early summer. Another project uh, that's a long time coming is that we're working with the village of Valemount and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy on an air quality data review project to better understand if and how dust events are associated with low water levels in the Kinbasket Reservoir. We're finally getting to looking at the data and then figuring out what the next steps would be. Another one that's near and dear to my heart is, is uh, working, uh, making progress, significant progress, working collaboratively with the six Crescent Valley Diking Authorities, uh, Nyakanuki uh, Community, Regional District of Central Kootenai, and the town of Creston, to find a way forward on, on the long standing issue of how to uh, maintain and repair the diking system in the Crescent Valley. And I know that when I started with government and out of Nelson 30 years ago, that was an issue uh, that was unresolved and, and we're finally making progress on that. So, so that is great. Um, 
On the agricultural side, we heard across the basin that agriculture was impacted by the treaty and needs support. And so we're working with some of the uh, agricultural communities in the basin. We're working with the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, we're looking at the programs and initiatives and identifying where there are gaps and, and that is ongoing. Uh, and of course, you know, we definitely heard concerns about the water levels at Kukanusa Reservoir, especially during the very important recreation season, June to September, and we commissioned a study to assess the feasibility of building a dam in the reservoir. And we'll, we are now, we have received, fee, we had a town hall, our first town hall um, you, uh, on, on the Kukanusa Dam. And we are now uh, uh, evaluating the feedback and we'll be producing a report and, and next steps in, in the next little while. So there's lots of things going on. Um, if you want to know more about it, uh, please sign up to our preliminary treaty newsletter. Oh God, fire alarm. Ugh, no. Attention, attention. We will be testing the fire alarm oh, bells. Oh great, okay, I'm almost finished. Fire alarm bells shortly, please disregard. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> I'll leave it for now, uh, but happy to answer more questions later in the evening. And thanks for taking the time and, you know, whether it's the treaty negotiations or work happening outside the treaty process, we really count on your involvement and your engagement and your advice to inform to work that we do. And we, you know, we've been doing that for the last 10 years and knowing the people in the Kootenays, I wouldn't expect anything less. So I'll stop before the fire alarm goes off. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy. What did I say about technical challenges? I think most people are used to being interrupted by their kids and their pets these days, not while they're at the office, a uh, fire alarm test. So um, good luck with that, Kathy. Hopefully it doesn't last too long because we would love to ask some more questions from you later on. Um, just to note that we are monitoring the questions that you guys are submitting in the Q&A box. Uh, I know some have or will be addressed by the speakers as we carry on, uh, but we will come back to asking them uh, as many as we can once the panelists are done um, and, and where possible interject with a few clarifying questions. So uh, thank you for submitting them. Please continue to do so. Um, for those who are having technical difficulties, I am so sorry. Uh, my only suggestion is to maybe sign out and sign back in again. Things seem to be working okay from our end. Um, and if for some reason your issues are not able to be fixed, then we just encourage you to either listen if you can or check out the recording of this after the fact. Uh, we're open to any and all feedback. So again, send us any challenges that you might be having uh, by email. So. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Nathan Matthew to share um, his thoughts and perspectives on the, the treaty modernization process um, as a representative from, from the Shkwetmik Nation. So Nathan, go ahead, thank you. Hello again. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, in terms of our perspective on, uh, and, I, and I think I, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of the, the, the three nations, uh, but I am from the Sequim Nation, uh, because we've decided to work together uh, as nations to, to represent uh, our interests uh, in, the, in the treaty negotiations. But uh, I guess the, the, one of the first perspectives that we have is, is, is that the creation of the, or, or the signing of the original Columbia River Treaty and the uh, implementation of the terms with respect to the uh, the building of the dams and and the changes in the uh, the water water courses uh, comprise the the biggest infringement on our, on our way of life or or the rights that we have to to exist in the basin and uh, so there's a very huge disruption with respect to our ability to carry on our, our, our ways of living, our, our, our rounds uh, to in fishing and hunting, gathering, uh, our medicines, our spiritual places have, have all been negatively impacted uh, by, by the system being put in place. So the, the perspective we had on, on that, we want that recognized by Canada and uh, the province of BC. And we, we want to have them that attended to and responded to. And uh, 
like uh, like so many other residents in, in the basin, originally we weren't consulted uh, with respect to any of this. And so our voice was not heard then. And uh, this time we're, we're really uh, determined to have our voices, our, our voices heard. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, our perspective, one of the perspectives is uh, we, we could get more done by working together rather than as three separate nations. And, and that's, that's what we've done. Um, the idea of being organized and uh, having commitments made by the province and Canada in the way that uh, we are involved, that's another perspective. We, we, we want, we don't, didn't want to be just uh, talk to or about or on an occasional basis, uh, but we wanted uh, full involvement in, in the uh, Columbia River Treaty uh, negotiations. So we've been able to do uh, a big part of that so far. We've been able to establish a, a framework agreement where Canada, BC and, and the three nations have uh, decided to work together in a government to government uh, relationship and that we've uh, agreed to, to collaborate, to respect each position or, or perspective, uh, to communicate in consistent ways and uh, transparency. Uh, we can uh, share information and request information and uh, so we can be fully engaged in all matters related to, to the renegotiation. And uh, that's happened. Uh, as a result of the signing of that that agreement, so, and uh, uh, I guess these perspectives are quite quite a bit related. But uh, we we wanted the whole piece to be seen as part of that reconciliation between First Nations, province, and Canada, and uh, that that could only be done. Uh, through cooperation, working in partnership, and in the ways that we structured it under the, uh, the framework agreement, and uh, to see this as a as a real step in in that uh, transformation of the uh, relationship, uh, and and certainly we've we we have our voice heard now. We are we have a seat at the table as observers to the main U Canada U.S. negotiations, and we uh, participate in all of the com committees that uh, are part of the information gathering and strategy making uh, with regard to moving the uh, negotiations forward. And uh, a big part of that, uh, and it's already been mentioned by Sylvain and Kathy, is that. Uh, We've taken a leadership role in ecosystem uh, research and uh, cultural values research. So uh, that's been a quite a challenge, but uh, we feel that the two are are, are really important to us. And uh, the that work, I think it, it's been described, will will provide recommendations on how the operations of the system can. Uh, most of, of appropriately uh, increase the, the, the values related to ecosystem functioning and uh, the improve the, the, uh, the values and interests of, of, of First Nations people in the, in the basin as well. And uh, the, the research is, is well underway and uh, I think Bill Green, uh, Jay Johnson and others will, will will describe that in a lot more detail, but that's the I, I think the perspectives are are very significant, and uh, at the end of the day, we we fully expect that uh, these interests will be recognized, understood, and dealt with in in, in positive ways, uh, government to government, and uh, that we can see a better relationship. Uh, coming out of it and uh, a better place for First Nations in, in terms of uh, being able to participate in uh, creating a better place down the road with respect to how the Columbia River system under the Columbia River Treaty works. So uh, 
that's a, those are a couple of perspectives. And uh, we know that it's a challenging uh, environment uh, as, we, as we go forward. And uh, dealing with some of these issues is simply in terms of ecosystem, the climate change and those kind of things are, are truly complex. But we're certainly uh, pleased and happy to be engaged in uh, developing the, the solutions to uh, those particular issues. So, thanks. Thanks so much, Nathan. That's great. Jay, we'll pass it over to you. Jay Johnson representing the Silks Okanagan Nation. Go ahead, Jay. And you're muted, Jay. Go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. There we are. There's always has to be someone muted, so might as well take the honors. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening. Why how school halts try soon squeeze. Um, my name is Jay Johnson. I'm the um, Chief Negotiator and Senior Policy Advisor to the Silk Okanagan uh, Nation Alliance and the Chiefs Executive Council. I've um, I grew up in the basin, and uh, I've been working with uh, the Silk Nation for um, about 20 years now in a variety of roles, uh, including on some pretty critical files on the land and in relationship to uh, to the governments and industrial users on on the territorial landscape, the unceded lands of the Silks Nation. Um, maybe I just wanted to sort of highlight a few things that were, were talked about already today and give you a sense of how far we've come. Um, as I'm sure many of you will understand, the, the, um, the treaty, of course, was something that uh, not only Basin residents inherited um, from the outside largely, um, but of course, the Indigenous nations, the First Nations of the Basin in its entirety in Canada, also were forced to, to live with the consequences of the, of the Columbia River Treaty and, and in many ways, the industrialization of the, of the river system. Um, the leadership of the chiefs and the ancestors before them uh, worked very hard for, for decades to try to resolve and uh, insert themselves and the interests of their communities into the center of, of the uh, Columbia River Treaty, its management decisions and and to uh, seek to restore some of the damages and the impacts that have occurred as a result of the treaty and as a result of many other industrial developments along the river. Um, and that approach has come from a position of understanding that the river is inherently, um, com and from a common sense perspective, uh, an ecosystem and is inherently one river, uh, regardless of an international border. And, Sometimes that tends to be uh, something that is a challenge in a management regime when it crosses an international border. Um, and so we're always striving for everyone to uh, recognize, although jurisdictions might vary, to recognize that this is in fact uh, a river with integrity and, uh, and a unified system uh, with many complex ecosystems and microsystems along the way. So. So in our, um, our leadership's pursuit of um, addressing the Timich and the Tumulach, the land and, and the water and the resources and the all living things and the interconnection of all living things, we, we have sought to um, pursue this unique time uh, in, in, in history where we have both the federal and provincial government in Canada that are uh, focused on uh, trying to resolve and address uh, the concerns and challenges of governance with Indigenous nations and the marginalization of Indigenous communities for, for generations. And um, so with both the federal Liberal government and the provincial NDP government, we've successfully managed to um, ensure that the voice of Indigenous nations are in fact within the treaty. And in fact, we're participating within the negotiating process itself as observers but also leading um, an area of keen interest to, to the nation, uh, to all the nations, which is ecosystem uh, function and an understanding of the environmental needs uh, of the river and of all those along the river and all those that may not have a voice. And uh, in that regard, we've been ensuring that we've, we are also talking about climate change. We're talking about uh, modeling uh, different water levels. We're looking at how cultural values can be inserted, not only in our negotiating process and in our relationships, 
but also uh, within the, uh, the needs of what the river uh, management system should look like. Um, and we're seeking the guidance of, of knowledge keepers and, and uh, traditional ecological knowledge in that process. Um, and of course, we've heard a little bit about governance. Uh, governance is a critical component of all this. It's a critical component of reconciliation. It's, uh, it's, it's another reason why we have inserted uh, UNDRIP and, and now the provincial drip out legislation and it's intense into our uh, agreement with the, with the NAT, um, the negotiation advisory team uh, to ensure that we're, uh, we're meeting and, and the expectations of free fire prior and informed consent. Um, and maybe I just wanted to say a few words about um, salmon. Um, salmon, of course, is a critical concern of, of all three nations. It's likely a critical concern of many of the residents uh, throughout the, the whole river system. And, uh, and as many of you know, for nearly 80 years, we've had uh, not had salmon up into the uh, Canadian portion of the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, the salmon have not been able to reach the spawning grounds and all the way to the headwaters. So uh, to that effort, we've been able to negotiate with uh, the two uh, federal and provincial governments and the remaining three governments in, in, um, in Canada, the Indigenous governments in Canada, First Nations governments, uh, uh, salmon recovery, um, uh, Columbia River Salmon Recovery Initiative, when we're calling it bringing the salmon home. And, and we've got a new website that I'll plug at the, at the end of this. And uh, we're really what we're trying to do is, it's an indigenous led initiative. We're trying to bring the salmon back up into the upper Columbia and ensure that uh, we have a sustainable run, uh, hopefully in the millions in the future. And we're working together to identify what, um, what kind of technical work needs to occur for that to happen and to ensure that we've got the, the right um, information to uh, prove that the feasibility of, of this is uh, sound and just and, and appropriate and sustainable. So I guess maybe uh, just to conclude, um, we, I'd like to say that uh, we're, we remain very hopeful um, to the outcome. We're, we're keenly involved in this process. This is, we've set, we're aware that we've set some international precedents with our participation and we wanna thank both levels of government for that. That, that's uh, some keen leadership all around the table to ensure that that occurred. And hopefully that'll pave the pathway for future generations and indigenous nations around the world to participate in international treaty discussions that affect and impact their, their territorial lands and their livelihood and their futures. So, so we're, we're very excited about what, where we, what we're gonna be doing in the future. And uh, we encourage the, the US government to do its best to ensure that the U.S. tribal uh, partners and our relatives in the U.S. are also as active in the negotiations on their side as well. So, Lim Lim. Thanks so much, Jay. And Bill, yeah, you're up. Go ahead, Bill. Kyukit, Hukakrik Bill Green. And I got to start by saying, wow, uh, 200 people that is very impressive from a lot of perspectives. And I thank all of you for, for this. When I go through the list of participants, I see many, many names I recognize from previous in-person meetings over the years. And it's just uh, amazing and impressive to see so many people uh, dedicated to and interested in uh, the future of the Columbia River Treaty and, and this uh, wonderful water system that we live with. Um, and I also see uh, a number of Tanaha people participating, people that I work for. Thank you. Um, I'll start with what I'm sure many of you have heard many times, that water is deeply sacred for many Indigenous nations. Uh, and I think it certainly is for the Tanaha Nation. And uh, I've had the honor of working for the Tanaha Nation, as well as the other nations going back 26 years. But it has, I've been directed to work to make things over that whole time to work to make things better for the water, for the fish, for all living things, and indeed, uh, in, in large measure, working with the hydro system. So the CRT, the Columbia River Treaty Renewal work is 
incredibly important to uh, all the nations, as, as you've heard. Um, I will say despite 26 years, a blip in time, it remains a very steep learning curve, steep and exciting learning curve. Uh, uh, in particular, to continue to learn a lot about uh, and understand Tanaha cultural values, the knowledge systems, and the worldview. So between 2012 and 2014, um, we did uh, internal work within the nation, communities engaged the Tanaha nation communities and citizens. And out of that process, it came up with uh, a set of eight defined key interests and principles that the nation wanted to achieve through negotiations. So uh, that set our mandate very cl clearly to work towards uh, realizing those principles and achieving those interests. We also, through that time, we also worked with BC to identify how can the Tanaha Nation and the other nations and the other governments work together to uh, identify how those principles can be advanced. So uh, right now I feel very happy. I've been able to report to the Tanaha Nation Council that reasonable to good progress is being made towards achieving all of the principles. And uh, that's quite remarkable. And uh, I think there's some good reasons why, which some others have spoken to, but starts with a strong Tanaha Nation Council team. Uh, Nathan and Jay have spoken about, you know, how incredibly valuable the collaboration between the three nations has been. I don't think we would have been able to make nearly as much progress without the three nations working together in, in, in this way. I mentioned as well the R word, reconciliation. Uh, I think it has been, it came at the right point in time where we had uh, largely had new provincial and federal governments, both governments moved to fully endorse the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That, you know, in terms of the CRT negotiation process and our, our, collabor our work with the federal and provincial government to that time, that really shifted the ground beneath us in a positive way. And not only was it the governments at the highest levels that uh, their endorsement of UNDRIP and subsequent actions like the 10 principles from the federal government, the, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act on the provincial level. It was the staff uh, from federal and provincial government that really embraced reconciliation as a foundational principle for moving this work forward. And so that has led to you know, really strong and effective collaboration between the five governments. And here I'll bring us to, and Sylvain and Kathy both spoke about the, the first comprehensive negotiations proposal that was developed by the Canadian team uh, and presented in late June to the US. And that was a very challenging time. It was very hard work, but all parties were trying to find strong common ground. And, and we got there and that was a remarkable achievement. And I think we can keep, uh, if the five government, I think the five governments will continue to work together and, and advance the work in a in a very positive way. So um, that's it for my comments uh, on that area. And do you want me to move straight into the technical work or take, uh, take a chance for some questions? Brooke? Yeah, maybe. Um, so I've seen a few questions that you might end up addressing in the next session. Uh, so maybe we'll scroll through to Bill is going to share an update on uh, the ecosystem function work, uh, which will also lead into the salmon restoration work. Um, and I know I've, I saw a question asking for more details on how climate change is being addressed as part of negotiations. Um, you know, there's, there's also been questions asking how the Indigenous nations are involved in negotiations. And uh, I, I would hope that hearing from Nathan, Jay and Bill, you've got a better sense of the level uh, of depth that they are all involved, um, you know, as, as part of the negotiating team, as contributing to all aspects of negotiations, uh, it's quite uh, unique and, and groundbreaking. And uh, as everybody has voiced, a lot of effort has gone into that, um, 
you know, both both hard work and emotional effort as well, if I can venture to say. So um, maybe with that, Bill, I'll, I'll let you continue on and share your update on the ecosystem function piece. Thanks so much. Uh, Brooke, can you see my screen? Uh, not quite yet. It, it might show up soon. So you all will get a break from Strictly Our Faces. Bill has a few slides to show you as well as he speaks to them. Uh, we can see them now, Bill, you can go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so from a Tanaha perspective, this starts with the foundation of Aklamas Kapikapsin all living things. And it's a profoundly, as I've come to learn, it's a profoundly important principle to the Tanaha. And it, it indeed embraces all living things and includes humans within the concept of all living things, not separate from. Um, and so that, you know, so all living things, we brought forward into the English concept of ecosystem function. Kathy told you about the uh, negotiation advisory team and the subcommittees on a variety of topics, including ecosystem function. So our ecosystem function work has, we've had a subcommittee for a little bit more than two years now involving the three nations working together, but as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, uh, Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, and the Upper Columbia Basin Environmental collaborative and uh, so it, it, that has been you know, a strong team, a strong and knowledgeable team to move this work forward. So the first thing we did was there's a lot of information out there that's been generated over the years. Some of the sources include from what use plan studies, um, but a variety of other sources that speak to how the hydro system affects ecosystem processes, ecosystem values. And so we, that was all reviewed and uh, generated a synthesis report that pulled all that information together and then identified knowledge gaps. Uh, and so to fill those knowledge gaps, the, uh, we identified 13 priority ecosystem function studies uh, funded by principally by the BC government and recently added to that uh, the an ecosystem function study pertaining to the Kootenai and Duncan River floodplains upstream at the south and north ends of Kootenai Lake. And um, the, the work that I've spoken about has been led by the Indigenous nations, but involves the other governments, outside consultants and academics. So brought together a really st <coughs> strong team. I'll quickly stroll th scroll through these slides, which uh, identify that there's three slides, identifies the studies and the status of those studies. I'm not going to speak to them. Uh, so there is this set, which were general ecosystem function studies, which provided a, a foundation for uh, all of the other studies. A set of studies, and people have asked a question, well, how are you dealing with, uh, or is the CRT work addressing uh, nutrient status, nutrient cycling, nutrient retention within the system. And, and that in turn speaks to the productivity of the ecosystems. And so we've had this work around uh, in three different areas, reservoir, river, and terrestrial productivity. A strong focus around uh, floodplain riparian and wetland ecosystem. Some people have asked about, well, how, how is the CRT work addressing wildlife needs? And I think this is a principal way that we're doing that. And then a set of five aquatic studies outlined there. And a number of people have asked about, well, what about uh, the way the, the flows uh, function or operate downstream of the dams and rapid changes to low levels at some point. And uh, so that, that question is being very comprehensively addressed in the riverine flows study. And, uh, and this speaks to where, so these, that's just a quick summary of the set of studies. Um, and next thing I'll speak to briefly, and this gets into a bit of techno geekery, which I'll try to minimize, but uh, 
So each of the studies, one of the key tasks is not only a report, but also what we call performance measures. And a performance measure is how we measure how a particular way of operating Arrow Reservoir or Kinbasket Reservoir or Duncan Reservoir or indeed Kukanusa, how that will affect a specific value. And those values can be in the themes of ecosystem function, cultural value, but also hydropower and flight control and recreational values and socioeconomic values all can have perform within each of those there can be a set of performance measures and the whole idea is we have to have a way when we are looking at different ways of operating the system we have to have a way of knowing whether it's better or worse for a particular ecosystem value or other value and so performance measure is simply uh, how we measure better or worse uh, for each of the each of the ecosystem function function and other values, uh, and it not only tells us is it better or worse, but it also tells us uh, how much better or how much worse. A key point I want to make is that um, I expect you know, we are working to getting this uh, done over the next two to three months, but we then anticipate. Uh, we will be seeking public input on the work that has been done so that uh, uh, residents throughout the basin, the Indigenous nations that we work for, citizens of the Indigenous nations can be confident that we have a good way of uh, evaluating potential changes, operational changes through the Columbia River Treaty. Kathy spoke a bit about uh, the modeling the modeling work and part of that is uh, developing scenarios and a scenario is just a what if what if we change the operation of the system this way what if we change the operation at Gainley side dam over the course of the year you know in a way to you know lots of people have talked about it to create a more stable reservoir so um, the work in these scenario work workshops is to develop uh, what ifs that might, what if scenarios that would be better, that we think might be better for ecosystem function, but also indigenous cultural values, but then that work needs to take the next step, next steps, I should say, to find scenarios that are better, across, as much as possible, better across the board for a broad set of values. And just want to conclude that uh, the ecosystem function process has been Fascinating and challenging. I think it's it's unique and precedent setting. You know, mostly when we when we've seen studies of this type before and the development of of, center of performance measures and models, that's been done by a big consulting firm, BC Hydro, and this has been a very different process that engages uh, all five governments, engages uh, a wide range of interests, and it's hard work but it has been collaborative and, uh, and very effective in that regard. So at the end of the day, we want to have, want to achieve strong and widespread support for the performance measures and, uh, and for the potential scenarios. And just want to final wrap up that to really appreciate the support of the BC government for this work and the support from both Canada and BC to very meaningfully address ecosystem considerations into a, into a renewed treaty. So thanks. And uh, Brooke, I look to you for advice about what you want to do about questions, seeing as we're beyond time for this session. Sure, Bill. Um, I think, so we were going to speak a little bit about salmon reintroduction uh, and uh, I'm not sure if you want to lead into that right now. Um, and then we could answer questions after. What do you think? Yeah, maybe I'll speak to that uh, briefly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And and I note that Jay has already spoken about that, so I don't yeah. I don't need to add very much. But uh, salmon restoration is being addressed in parallel in two different uh, venues, two different processes. One is within the Columbia River Treaty because there are factors and issues related to salmon restoration that need to be addressed within the treaty context can't be addressed outside of it. And then there's a whole <clears throat> another set of 
issues and factors that really aren't directly impacted by the Columbia River Treaty. So habitat, uh, what are appropriate donor stocks, uh, what are the risks associated with it. And so that work is going on within the Columbia River Salmon Restoration Initiative. Jay spoke about that briefly, and I think Kathy did as well. And, uh, but it's really important that uh, the work between the Columbia River Salmon Restoration, which I will say is also going, all five governments are really committed to trying to make the Columbia River Salmon Restoration Initiative work. This is, uh, for me, very exciting to see the five governments working so hard and collaboratively on this and uh, making, making good progress on defining and working through some of the technical issues through the, what we call cursory, Columbia River Salmon Restoration Initiative, as well as, you know, where, where needed addressing treaty related salmon restoration issues with, within the treaty process. So, uh, and I think Jay spoke about, and maybe we can put it in the chat, uh, the link to uh, Columbia River Salmon CA, I believe. And you no, know, we look to a time. So the cursory, the Salmon Restoration Initiative is had a three year time frame that started in July of 2019. So we're a year and a half, <coughs> a year and a half in, and uh, we have a year and a half to go. Uh, a lot of work to accomplish over the next year and a half. In particular, putting, uh, doing the work that's necessary to answer people's questions and answer decision makers' questions about uh, what is the way forward, how much it's gonna to cost to do this, and so we can do the work to achieve the funding to keep the Salmon Restoration Initiative moving forward. So I don't know, Jay, if you want to add anything to that, but uh, that's a brief summary of that work. Thanks, Bill. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, I just encourage everybody to have a look at that website. Um, we just got it up, so there might be a few um, tweaks, but still, still to come. Uh, you'll notice that on May 10th and 6th to the 16th, we're going to be um, engaged in a series of um, um, events that culminate in essentially in a salmon recovery festival, um, and there'll be uh, a variety of things to be announced uh, throughout the basin and hopefully um, encourage, encourage community members and, and, and uh, youth and, and everyone interested to, to come out and participate in some of those events, as you'll see, uh, COVID friendly, of course. So uh, some details still to come, but they'll be announced on the website. So have a look at that. There's lots of great work being done there and it's, it's a heck of an initiative and it's taken a long, long time to, to, to implement and, and uh, uh, we'll be reaching out and we're in the early, early stages of reaching out across the border to our, to our U.S. Uh, cousins and relatives and friends to, uh, to try to work collaboratively as, as we best we can to ensure that we have success in the long run and we get to a place where we've got sustainable um, salmon runs of variety of salmon species into the future. And not only is this great news for, for the ecosystem and, and everyone along, along the river system and in the basin in Canada, but um, it's fantastic news uh, internationally as well. Um, so um, big thumbs up to all those involved and everyone that supported us along the way. And uh, we just look forward to renewing that three year commitment to uh, into the future as, as, as soon as we can. So Lim Limped, thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Jay, and thanks so much, Bill. Uh, I know folks, I see people asking in the Q&A box about the website, um, and it is columbiariversalmon.ca. Uh, I'm not sure how to put that up on the screen here for you guys to see at this, at this point, but I've typed it into the chat box, columbiariversalmon.ca. Um, at this point, I think, Bill, if you are comfortable with it, there were a couple of questions sent in advance of this session that uh, perhaps you can answer. Uh, there were a number, obviously, to do with salmon that hopefully you and Jay have addressed. Um, are, Jim, Bill, are you comfortable answering some of the questions and would you like me to read them out or would you like to take, take it from here? 
Thanks, Brooke. Yeah, I see, you know, I hope we've covered a, a lot of the uh, salmon related questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the questions I'll speak to briefly is um, Arrow Lakes fluctuations. And the specific question was, what efforts are going to be made to keep the water levels consistent along the Arrow Lakes? And uh, we, through the ecosystem function work in particular and the development of performance measures and scenarios, we're looking very closely at that question. And uh, obviously there's a lot of work being done in the past about a more stable aero scenario. And so the, the ecosystem function studies, for example, pertaining to restoring floodplain wetland and riparian ecosystems speaks to the aero reservoir and particularly the upper reaches. What benefit could be achieved if the reservoir was operated in a more stable way, what benefit could be achieved for floodplain riparian and wetland ecosystems and for the wildlife associated with that and the human use associated with that and the stabilization of banks that some people have also asked questions about. So the idea there is um, we're trying to quantify what operational change would be required to uh, achieve some degree of restoration of ecosystem function, or sorry, of floodplain riparian and wetland function, <clears throat> and then to build that into a, a what if a scenario and, and say, okay, what are the, if we operated the air reservoir in this way, what are gonna be the benefits and what are gonna be the impacts? So that all comes to the modeling that Kathy spoke, spoke about where we look at what if scenarios and, and look at a wide range of performance measures and say, okay, across the board, this looks like it could be better than what we currently have or not. So that's the kind of work that's being done. And it's not just about ecosystem function. I think it's around, it speaks to, there's work within the socioeconomic values realm around that and hydropower, flood control, et cetera. <coughs> so that's it for that question, I hope. Is there another one, or should I take on another one? Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, how about you take on one more uh, and then we'll we'll move on. Um, and again, just a reminder to everybody, we're looking at the questions and we'll we'll answer those that have been entered into the Q&A box at, after our panelists are done. Uh, so Bill, go ahead and, and choose one more question that we received before this meeting to answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Brooke. And, uh, so this question was on the theme of flow changes downstream of Hugh Keenly side. And the question was, will the section of the Columbia River below the Hugh Keenly side dam be able to have less dramatic flow changes under the new CRT? Presently, the flow changes are set on a weekly basis and can see drops of water levels of up to one meter over a 24 hour period. Uh, that could even, if this was done over a three day time period, there would be much less damage to the aquatic entomology, the bugs, that thrives along the 43 kilometers shoreline. So in answer to that, uh, one of the slides I presented spoke about riverine flows, and it is very focused on the question that, uh, <laughs> that the questioner raised. And so it is about what flows are required to sustain uh, pr the productivity in the bottom of the river and in the river and to support uh, key uh, life history functions of different fish species and of bugs in the river system. So sometimes we refer to this as, as functional flows. What are the elements of flow patterns downstream of the dam that are really important ecologically? And then we have to generate performance measures that, that speak to that and tell us when a particular flow operation would actually be an improvement and when it would be, when it would have adverse consequences. So we can look at, uh, when we look at any scenario, be it a hydropower related scenario or a uh, flood control related scenario or combined scenario, how will that affect um, functional flows and the various components of functional flows uh, in that river reach and indeed in, in other river reaches that experience similar things. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Bill. 
Um, and I know that there were lots of other questions asked about relating to ecosystems, um, but there's also questions that are being raised uh, in other areas of the treaty as well. So we want to get to those before the end of the night. Um, so before we move on, I know we've been going for about an hour and a half now, and I'm hoping those of you joining us from home have been standing up and stretching, maybe grabbing something from the fridge, who knows. Uh, our, our next speakers are from the Local Governments Committee and what they have to say links into uh, especially the scenario modeling that's been talked about. Uh, so maybe I will ask our speakers if they are ready to continue on or if they would prefer a short break to stand up and grab a glass of water. Um, Linda and Cindy, how are you feeling? Do you want to car carry on or should we take a minute to stretch our legs? And you both may be muted. Hello. Oh, hi, Linda. Hi. Hello. I think it's important for folks to be able to have a moment or two just to stretch and move around a little bit so that they, they can listen and understand what we're saying without thinking about cramping legs. <laughs> that sounds great, Linda. Okay, so with that, um, we're going to pause right now for, let's say, you know, two minutes. Uh, we don't want to lose too many of you and certainly want to leave enough time to answer questions. So um, we'll take a couple minutes here to pause and come back for more in a couple of minutes. Thank you all. All right, folks, I think we can bring ourselves back. I hope everyone had a chance to stand up and move around a little bit, if you haven't been already. So now I'd like to pass it over to Linda Worley, who's the chair of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee. Welcome, Linda. 
Thank you. Uh, and invite Cindy, I believe you've got some slides to share. So uh, whenever you're ready to do that, you can go ahead. Uh, and the, there we go. Linda, I'll pass the mic over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Brooke. And I just first want to recognize and respect that our committee and we live and meet within the unceded territories of the Columbia Basin Indigenous Nations peoples. And thank you to everyone for making time for the, this event this evening. And it's important that as Basin residents, we continue to be fully engaged in discussions about the treaty. Thank you to the BC CRT team for the invitation to participate in tonight's town hall. I want to recognize the committee's vice chair, Stan Doyle from area B of the RDEK and other committee members who've joined us this evening, as well as other local, provincial and federal elected officials who have joined this evening for this meeting. On behalf of the committee, I want to acknowledge and share our support for the addition of the Indigenous Nations to the negotiating team and for their leadership in the integration of ecosystem functions into the treaty. I thank Bill for his words on this work. Ecosystems are very important to the Basin residents and it's heartening to know that integrating this interest into the treaty is being taken seriously. Next slide, please. Thank you. The committee includes 10 elected officials appointed by local governments across the basin. Our communities continue to be greatly impacted by the treaty operations as shown by these pictures. We have embraced the statement from a community meeting in Jaffrey some years ago that, that we need to acknowledge the losses and enhance what remains. Since 2011, the committee has been working with with the BC CRT team and then with the negotiating team to ensure the voices of the basin residents are included in decisions related to the treaty. We have listened carefully to what basin residents have said is important in our communities during the many community meetings that were held and that we've attended. We've also sought advice on more technical topics to prepare our recommendations to the government. In 2013, we repaired we prepared our first recommendations and in January we sent updated recommendations to the five governments on the negotiating team and more about this in the next slide. We've also recently accepted leadership to provide recommendations on integrating socio-economic interests in the CRT modeling to inform the treaty negotiations. Our executive director will tell you more about this in a few minutes. We have regular communications with the BC team and the negotiating team to share updates and discuss issues. We advocate for the solutions to community specific and broader domestic issues. Next slide, thank you. Our updated recommendations include expanded information for several sections as listed on this slide. And a new section on modernized governance and Kathy mentioned this uh, governance work um, that is underway. We look forward to participating in the process to ensure local governments and basin residents have mechanisms for meaningful long-term engagement in treaty governance going forward, unlike in the past and now. We encourage feedback from you on the updated recommendations. Um, Google AKBLG CRT and click on our recommendations to get the recommendations um, there and feedback from Basin residents have been positive so far, which is great to see. And we hope to hear from you if you have any comments on this. So please take the time to do this. The committee is very aware of public commitments from the BCCR team to bring any elements of the negotiated agreement um, that impact the region back to the residents and local governments for, re for review before negotiations are finalized. Thank you to the province for that commitment. We encourage all of you to become well-educated about the treaty and to stay informed about the ongoing negotiations to be ready to provide input when invited. The BC CRT Engage website and CBT CRT website have lots of helpful information. So I encourage you to go there and have a look around and see what's on there. We look forward to continuing to work closely with the negotiating team and the BC team to ensure 
concerns and issues for the basin residents, residents and communities are addressed in the treaty negotiations and through so solutions we can implement domest domesticality. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Cindy in a moment, but I just want to remind people that the local government committee is a team of Columbia Basin elected officials um, that continue to advocate for the basin interests and has been connecting with the CRT negotiations throughout, negotiators throughout. And the updated recommendations um, have been published and we encourage you to go onto the website to um, look at them again and make any comments that you have. So I'll turn it over to Cindy Pierce, the committee's executive director for a brief introduction to our new socio-economic integration work. And thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening, people. Take it away, Cindy. You are muted. Got it. So, I'm sorry, folks, managing slides and muting, unmuting is beyond my technical capacity at this time of the night. Thank you for your patience. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We can't see you, but that's uh, up to you whether you want to share your video as well. Uh, we can certainly hear you though. So go ahead, Cindy. Thank you. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Great to see you. Great. So thank you, Linda. And I want to echo the thanks uh, that Linda expressed and others have to all of you who are still on the line at this hour of the evening. Um, it's really important that as facing residents, we continue to share information about this important topic. So Kathy mentioned in her presentation about uh, CRT scenario modeling and um, Bill has spoken about it at great length. So I think you've got the basics. I'm going to add to that with a bit of a, a, a detailed description and then talk specifically about um, the work that the committee is doing on refining the integration of socioeconomic interests to inform the negotiations. Technology. There we go. So we're just at the, at the very beginning of this process and we've been uh, reviewing uh, past documents um, uh, that have included uh, articulated community interest in the basin. And uh, we've identified a number of different types of socioeconomic interests, including um, flooding and erosion, navigation, recreation and tourism, uh, health, particularly dust generation, and, and agriculture. These are the sort of the preliminary set of interests that we see in the, in the in, and have heard about in the community meeting. We expect we'll hear more as we work our way through this process. So to put a picture to build words, um, this CRT modeling process is intended to inform negotiations. And as Kathy mentioned, in the long term to evaluate alternatives for uh, implementing the treaty once it's been completed. So we start off, that's the outcome that we're looking for here. We start off with what I call what matters. Bill has spoken, um, and Nathan and, and Jay have spoken about the indigenous cultural values. Bill's spoken about the ecosystem function work. The committee is working on the socioeconomic uh, interest, and BC Hydro has provided information on, on sort of the power interest. Um, the, the, uh, the Bill has then described the creation of alternative hydro operation scenarios, or the what if. What if we operated the river this way or that way? He's also spoken about the performance measures, that we translate these things that matter into metrics of performance measures, so we can put them into this river management model, and that model will tell us how, uh, through um, performance measure outcomes, how well each of those what if models uh, met the uh, performance measures and what matters to basin residents and indigenous nations and, and other interests. All of that information will be provided to the negotiators and inform their negotiations about what needs to be in the treaty. So I want to emphasize that not one what if scenario will be included in the treaty. Uh, this is to inform the space to create flexibility in the Canadian operations of the treaty primarily. 
That's the purpose of this work. I also want to mention that this river management model includes both the Columbia and the Kootenay rivers from their headwaters through to uh, the ocean. And it includes the major structures on those systems as well, including the Little Dam, uh, which floods the Kenosa Reservoir back into, into BC. Um, we needed to have a model that includes the whole system so that things like salmon restoration could be carefully considered. And also to evaluate US proposals that, that come to the negotiating team. So we we're just at the beginning of this work. Our timeline um, started back uh, just before Christmas. We've been reviewing documents and collecting information. We're now in the process of kind of designing the engagement, uh, working with the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, which is um, a diverse group of, of basin residents and appointees from local governments and indigenous nations that represent a, a broad range of perspectives, interests, and uh, geographies. And they've been in place since 2014, uh, providing, um, you know, providing informing, pardon me, informing uh, hydro operations and the, the CRT negotiations. And we're intending to work closely with them on this work. So we're wanting to speak with them about um, how they want to be engaged and how they would suggest the public should be engaged in, engaged in this work as well. We'll then take their input and continue collecting information to create some initial performance measures over the, uh, the spring and into the summer, and then bring that back to you in the public for your feedback in September to October, and um, revise, and, revise and refine and make recommendations to the BC team before the end of the year. Sometime in the fall, perhaps a bit earlier, we will start sort of confidential scenario modeling, um, um, looking at, as Bill described, what, what ifs might um, provide the best outcomes for the socioeconomic interests. And uh, that will be uh, provided to the negotiating team to inform their their, uh, their modeling that would include all of the interests over time. So uh, we will be reaching out to you um, in either uh, late spring um, or into the fall uh, to invite you to provide public feedback on these performance measures. So you can watch our website, GPRT. Um, or you can, um, I will be posting our activities on the Engage um, CRT website, the BC website as well. I hope that's helpful and thank you for hanging in there to this point in the evening. Thanks so much, Cindy. And maybe I could ask just a quick question or point of clarity for folks who might not know what socioeconomic performance measures are. Could you give an example of what one might be, for example? Um, yeah. Well, um, I'll use a, a navigation example. Um, to get log booms through the narrows between the two arrow lakes, the river flows and the narrows need to be at a certain elevation. So um, a performance measure for navigation on arrow reservoir might be uh, the number of days the reservoir is above whatever the minimum level is where they can move logs. For recreation, it, it might be an elevation range that allows um, access to primary uh, boat access locations. Is that helpful? Definitely. Thanks so much. Helps kind of put it into context for folks. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, so thanks so much, Cindy and Linda. That was uh, great, and it and it wraps up our panelist session for the night. Uh, I'll echo Cindy comments. Thank you for everybody who's hung out uh, up until now. There, I'm looking at the attendee list and there's still 163 of you still online. And there's a good number of folks who are, have phoned in too, which is, which is awesome. Um, so I'd like to take this chance to answer some of the questions that have been posed finally in the Q&A box here. Uh, and I'll, I will read them out so folks on the phone know what the questions are. Uh, and then some of our panelists can identify if they'd like to answer them or not. Um, this is also the time of night that my dog is scratching at the door. So if you hear something that sounds slightly creepy, that's what it is. Sorry, everybody. Uh, so the, the first question at the very top here that was asked quite earlier on, I'll read it out. It's, it's, it says, in the wake of British Columbia creating and implementing Bill 41 in 2019, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, 
And in considering that the Columbia Basin Trust Act, which created this, the Columbia Basin Trust is in receipt of the downstream benefits of the Columbia River Treaty on entirely unceded Indi Indian land as per Royal Proclamation of 1763, will British Columbia and Canada recognize articles three and four of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in particular, the right to self-determination and to fund their own institutions and in doing so, make substantial and meaningful changes to the Columbia Basin Trust Act so that the Indigenous peoples will be in part reconciled with, for example, e equal partners recipients in all downstream benefits, whereas the Indigenous peoples will be able to freely choose how those funds are used without interference. Can I invite one of the panelists to either comment uh, or, or attempt to answer the question there? Uh, Brooke, I'd like to, but it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, weird. Um, I will see if I can unstop your video, but Kathy, why don't you go ahead and sure, I will- Sure, and then I'll, 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 I'll invite, okay, okay. <laughs> Yay! Okay, yay. Um, <laughs> and I'll invite others to, to step in. Um, you know, we are very alive to the, the commitment and, and very committed to implementing the declaration and that's why the province has, has uh, passed the act. Um, and, and that uh, Indigenous nations uh, deserve are entitled to uh, benefits of what happens activities on their on their in their territory and so we are having discussions actually broadly and we're starting to have those discussions on uh, sharing benefits relating to the Columbia River Treaty and and more broadly the the hydro system so uh, very timely I mean they the uh, the province invested almost half a billion dollars on Columbia Basin Trust and Columbia Power Corporation way back when. And the trust now um, uh, ha earns annually $65 million a year approximately, which is, you know, at times more than half the Canadian entitlement. And, and there is participation on the trust board uh, by uh, some Indigenous nation or some representation, but um, that is that is something that really is is a very good uh, point to raise, and that will be I'm sure pursued. So, I invite the others to jump in. Thank, <clears throat> thanks very much, Kathy, and and uh, Spill Green here. Thanks, Troy, for the question. The um, yeah, I'll just add briefly to Kathy's answer, which is. Uh, the five governments agreed to establish a benefit sharing subcommittee under the negotiations advisory team. And there are uh, very much uh, active live discussions on the topics you raise and even in a broader context around uh, benefit sharing. So good question. And uh, this work is, uh, is going on under the negotiation advisory team. A and I'll add with, with uh, direction from leadership in this regard as well. Thanks. Yes, it, it's Sylvain speaking. Uh, I just want to reiterate, and, and everybody knows that, but you know, in 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 2016, uh, Canada um, um, in 2016, you know, Canada endorsed the the United Nations Declaration without qualification and, and committed to its full and, and effective implementation. And, and in December of last year, the government introduced legislation to implement the declaration. This, this, so, so there's no question that, that the government is committed to the, the implementation of UNGRIP. Now, this being said, it's very complex. And, and you know we have to look at ways you know, to implement the declaration in all aspects of, of, of government activity. So, uh, you know, when, when comes the time to talk about how, what this would mean uh, very precisely for one particular issue, it, it's, it's still a little early and hard to, to, uh, to expand on this, but I just wanted to make 
uh, this intervention to say that there, there, there is a commitment there and legislation that is being considered. Thank you so much, Sylvain, and to Bill and to Kathy for that. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, there is a multi-part question, so, but maybe I'll just choose, I'm gonna choose one part of the question. Uh, and I should also mention too that all the, like there's no way we're gonna be able to get through all of these tonight, uh, but we will absolutely include answers to these questions in our summary report for this meeting. Uh, and, and all of these questions have been viewed by the panelists and I'm sure many of the folks who are, who are linked in. Um, so we'll keep making our way through the, the questions and just know that, that they will be answered no matter what. Uh, so one part of this question is some authors believe that it is necessary to go beyond international law to think in a more inclusive way, the governance of the Columbia River Treaty. Can we imagine a permanent transnational forum bringing together actors of various statuses? Um, does anybody want to respond to that question about a transboundary governance possibility? So let you go ahead. Well, uh, you know, without, we're, we're still negotiating, right? So we, we don't know what's going to come out of this and, and, and all elements of a future modernized treaty, you know, have, have to be agreed upon before one of them is agreed upon, right, formally. Um, um, there is already some sort of transnational governance to the treaty. So, so transnational will not be new. We are looking at ways to, to, to address governance issues, both internationally, i.e. between the US and Canada, and domestically. So yes, these issues are being considered. Perhaps, Kathy, you want to expand on? Uh, no, that's that's fine, uh, Sylvain. That's great. OK. Thank you. So moving down the list, um, somebody has asked if Indigenous groups are represented on CRT treaty negotiating team. I hope that you've seen here tonight that, yes, in fact, they are. Um, and yes, there is common ground between uh, their interests uh, and, and others involved in the treaty negotiations and um, basically people who are affected by the treaty. Uh, many, many shared interests there. So thank you for that question. Uh, there, somebody has asked, I, I, I've often wondered about the grave sites in Flagstaff Tobacco Plains, uh, where they used to be, which is now flooded over by Kukanusa. Um, maybe an acknowledgement about the grave sites that are now currently under the water. That's not an uncommon uh, thing over, over the you know, millennia, basically. Um, so thank you for raising that. Uh, can, I, like? can I just respond? That that is uh, part of the work that uh, Ingrid Strauss from our team is is uh, leading with the steering committee. And I earlier on I mentioned the stories around the basin and areas that were impacted and communities that were impacted. And so those places are going to be part of the story that will be told when the uh, Heritage uh, Columbia River. Uh, Basin Heritage Tour will be put in place. They're very important. Thank you, Kathy. And we have another comment here uh, and question. How is the indigenous communities of bands of American Indians of the Columbia River being factored into this treaty as some of us are still sought for extermination to date? For the good of all, we have been apprehended for extermination. Genocide is a real thing that must be heard on a matter of treaties and negotiations. Our suffering, pain, and loss is immeasurable. To say sorry is not enough. Reparations are in order. Celio Falls, our sacred ancestor, was taken prisoner of war. Would anybody like to make comment? Um, thank you for sharing that, that experience with us. Well, I, I could share a little something, but also if, if anybody else on the panel wants to. Um, yes, of course, uh, I, I saw one of the comments in, in, in the list that you're reading that said, it seems to be that the indigenous nations of Canada, and I'll address the US side after, indigenous nations of Canada are observers, but they seem to be a little bit more than observers. I'll give you my point of view, if, if, and if one 
if one of the my colleagues from Indigenous Nation wants to chip in. I certainly don't believe that they're only observers. I do not consider them as just observers. Uh, observers was a term that was chosen and it represents maybe uh, what they what what happens when we are sitting down at the table with the United States, right? Where where when 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 we have a bilateral negotiation, the chief negotiator speaks for the Canadian delegation, and my counterpart in the U.S. does. However, when we get into the room next door and we talk about how it went and whether I did well or not, and what's going on, and how should we amend our positions, I can tell you, we're not talking about indigenous nation observers here. Or when we prepare our positions uh, to be presented to the US, it, I, as the chief negotiator, consider the voice and the proposals and the comments and the opinions of, and, and Kathy does the same for an, an any member of our delegation, uh, we consider these um, these inputs from them as equal to all of us, right? So that's on the Canadian side. But on the U.S. side, yes, there has been some involvement um, uh, uh, on the U.S. delegation. I wish someone from their delegation was was in this meeting, but this this meeting is even though there are American participants in this meeting, it's 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 a Canadian British Columbia initiated. And led meeting, uh, so yeah, we've ha we have seen uh, members of um, of uh, tribal members come to the negotiations and also make presentations on some issues. Right? Uh, I won't comment on 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 the extent that they are involved because I don't know. I don't sit in in the U.S. delegation meetings. Right? I will risk some comments of a couple of things that we're seeing, uh, not here to promote an administration over another, but um, I think that there are some pretty key positions now that have impact on tribal um, life and, and, and uh, influences everything they do. There are some pretty key decision uh, positions that are in the process of being filled for the first time by representative of tribal or, or indigenous nations of the US. So I think it's a good sign, uh, but I'm not there to promote what the US delegation does, but uh, I, I will finish this intervention by saying that I'm very happy uh, that uh, and thrilled that our, our indigenous nations are part 100% of this exercise and of the Canadian delegation for two reasons. A, it's the right thing to do, and B, boy, um, they keep us honest. And not that I have a tendency to be dishonest, but they keep us honest and on our toes and certainly contribute, uh, uh, make very valuable contribution to all the work we do. And I, I'm not saying this to just be nice. That's true. So I'll end here. Thank you so much, Sylvain. And I received a message uh, from Bill. Bill, you'd like to add a little bit more to one of the previous questions. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Thanks, and I just wanted to add a bit to the question about uh, burial sites, and they were particularly referenced uh, near Tobacco Plains. And it's an important point, and, I, and Nathan spoke earlier about the work that's being done around cultural values, and the idea of the cultural values work, and it incorporates addressing things like uh, burial sites, like uh, archeolo other archeological sites, but also you know, uh, things that aren't uh, physically tangible, but cultural values that are tied to a, a place or a location or a reservoir level uh, without any physical evidence, of, physical evidence of that. The idea of the cultural value studies is to see are there different ways of operating the reservoirs that could, would have less impact on cultural values. And that's a very huge piece of work, a very difficult question to answer, but it is very much a piece of work that uh, uh, the nations are engaged in. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. 
So I'll ask, I'll ask one more question from the Q&A box and I see somebody has their hand raised. So we'll move over to that um, to listen to that person's question. So the next question here is the Canadian comprehensive proposal available to read now or must we wait until the negotiations are complete? Uh, I feel that that's been addressed, but does anybody want to speak further to that at all? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can just, and Kathy will, will certainly uh, want to, to perhaps complement what I say. This, this is always, as, as a negotiation is going on, a, a, a significant balance, balancing act, right? Between what we share publicly with those who are involved and what we don't. So the governments of everybody, the, everybody that is touched by, by the, the negotiation is represented by their governments in the negotiation team, right? There's representative from the BC government, which represents BC people, the indigenous nations. Canada is there because it's a treaty between um, Canada and the US. So, you know, we, we are all involved uh, in, in that way. The, what we share and how much we share and how we share is very complex and, and very touchy, right? Um, for example, the US, the US can say, and we've told the US, we're making a proposal now. You, we don't want you to share that publicly just yet. They say the same, right? There are reasons why these negotiations are held at up to a certain extent behind closed doors. Now, my colleagues in the trade negotiation world, you know, are a great example if you follow what's been done over the decades. Um, when, when, when the first uh, treaty, Canada-US trade uh, free trade agreement was negotiated, there were some consultations, uh, not that much, uh, not much things were, were talked about publicly. Um, as it evolved more and more uh, the consultation process for any kind of agreement uh, became you know a lot more uh, extensive and a lot more interlocutors and stakeholders were consulted right uh, and, and and the Columbia River Treaty is a case in point uh, the consultation in the 1960s <clears throat> when it was first negotiated is nothing compared to what we do now right um, but the sharing of formal proposal is is a uh, is is a thing that is a little bit more sensitive. Eventually, like Kathy said, uh, before any decisions are made or before anything is signed and cast, uh, the people uh, who are impacted by this will will be informed and consulted. Uh, there are different ways we can do that, right? Um, but. Uh, for now, we're, we're, we're not at a point now, and we're certainly not advanced enough um, to, to be able to make these things public. I will give you a, I'll finish there after that. I'll give you a personal opinion. Um, I'm a human being like everybody else, so I've, I've got my understandings and I've got my flaws too. And, and, but I have, I feel that what we have presented to the US as our first formal offer, in the same way as all the discussions we've had before, are all very much representative of everything I've heard and read about what Indigenous nations and Basin residents and other stakeholders uh, want to be pushed forward. This being said, some of the things that are being pushed forward uh, are actually uh, mutually exclusive. So, so at one point, you can only do so much uh, on, 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 on our side to, to reconcile everything. And of course, at the end of the day, we are negotiating with a significant uh, partner and we can't all get what we want, right? And there's a lot of give and take um, that, that is, that, you know, and trial and error that is being done during these negotiations. But anyways, I feel very comfortable that what I presented to the US formally in June uh, is representative of what we've heard. And if we wanna know by and large what it is that we've presented on and on what are the issues that have been raised, Kathy mentioned earlier, it is very much in line with 
with the position that was um, um, uh, laid out in uh, the recommendation to negotiate that was published in 2012, I think. But anyway, 13. I'll stop here. Long, long answer, but I'll stop. Well, I certainly have nothing to add after that, Suzanne. That's fine. Thank you, Sylvain. So uh, now we're going to flip over to somebody who has their hand raised. Uh, Madeline McKay, I'm going to uh, allow you to unmute yourself. And if you're still interested in asking a question, you should be able to ask it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Go ahead. I am wondering if those of you on the Canada side of the negotiation are also at the same time working with the federal government to undo the declaration of extinction from 1956 of the Sanaixt people, since they are the original people of the Columbia River, or what we call that. And if now at this point, um, it seems like an ideal time to make sure they're partners in this conversation. 80% of, I live in the cusp, 80% of their lands were, living sites were flooded. So yeah, I just wonder if, if that's a parallel effort going on to make sure Indigenous voices are respected. Thank you. Kathy, you want to go ahead? I, I'll just, I'll just, uh, yes, there have been uh, conversations between the BC government and, and uh, particularly in the area of ecosystem fish and wildlife with, with uh, the Colville, uh, the Federation of Colville Tribes and, and, uh, and, and of course, there's the very important Supreme Court of Canada uh, case that uh, where we're waiting decision, but we, ought, we definitely respect and honor the decision of the lower courts uh, that affirm the rights of the Snikes in, in uh, BC. Uh, with regards to the negotiation, that's a little tricky. Um, and, I, and I remember a couple of years, two, well, a year, two years ago, uh, I was in California for an adaptive management uh, conference and, and, and the chairman Marchand was there and we talked about the negotiations and and we said well it would be tricky because um, you know the tribes in the U.S. are being consulted with the state department by the state department and and so being consulted on negotiating positions with Canada it puts it, uh, people uh, uh, in a precarious position and we haven't had uh, 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 any r request or, uh, to uh, engage in the negotiations per se on the Columbia River Treaty. Um, but I, I definitely recognize uh, that the, and the courts and respect the court's decision regarding uh, the Lakes Division of the Colville Tribes and their rights in, in, in Canada. And, and, and thank you, Kathy. Uh, the other thing I, I will ask, I, I will add in that context, and first of all, thank you for your question. And of course, um, terrible things that have happened in the past. And as a white person, I will never be able to fully appreciate them. I, 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 I have an intellectual capacity to realize that that was really bad, but I, I can't really feel it because it never happened to me, so I'm not going to take over Madeline uh, this part. However, one one thing I want to say, and, and as I was looking at the questions, right, there's a lot of very valid points and very um, very um, important issues that are being raised, such as the one you raised, uh, you know, and but we have to remember also that we are in in a context of negotiating with the United States a very, how should I put this, a very concrete treaty that, that um, cannot encompass everything else that needs to be resolved, right? Um, and, 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 and the treaty is, is about dams that were built and water management and, and you know, and impacts that these dams and this water management is having, both on indigenous nations and 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 basin residents. But we can't address everything, right? But 
of course, we, we try to use the, the and because we realize that as, as, as representative of the federal government, and, and Kathy is probably going to agree as a representative of, of a provincial government, that we also have a responsibility to, 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 to maybe be an agent of change for other issues while we can't resolve them ourselves. Right? Um, a good example of that is the work that we are doing uh, on, on considering the feasibility of, of salmon reintroduction, which could end up being going further than just that, depending on the result of the work. You know, when you look at it, if you, the treaty dams have not stopped any salmon from coming to Canada, right? The, the dams that did are not part of the treaty, were built before the treaty. So we can't really resolve that. But what we have decided to do is two things. A, try to push this issue to be addressed because it needs to be addressed treaty or not. And the other thing is make sure that whatever we do or agree to in the treaty does not become something that will preclude an eventual reintroduction sh should we find the ways and means of doing that, right? So what we do should not hurt, should not hurt, hurt the reintroduction of salmon, but negotiating with the treaty with the US who is also part of the decision as to what this negotiation should and should not entail, uh, cannot address all of the, these other issues. But we, if we can be an agent of change, we being the people involved in, in, in the Columbia River Treaty Modernization, we will be, and, and we, we are trying to be, in some of those issues. Thank you, great. Thank you so much, Madeline, for your question and to Kathy and Sylvain for the answers. So I do notice that we are at 8.15, which is when we officially said that we were going to wrap up. Um, and I've seen you know, people leaving as they need to. I'm still very impressed to see 144 people on this call. Uh, so if panelists are okay with it, we'll keep going through and asking questions um, for, for as long as we have the stamina. Uh, so with that, and, and of course, anybody who needs to log off, obviously do that. Um, look back to the BC Columbia River Treaty website for all follow-up material on this session, including a survey that will help us improve on future sessions. Uh, so if you need to hop off, please uh, make a note to do that. So uh, a next question here, what are the relative weights that the US attributes to the three areas of focus of the treaty, flood control, power generation, and ecosystem services? What are Canada's weights? I, I have a guess as to what the answer to this is going to be uh, given that negotiations are confidential, but Sylvain or Kathy, would either of you like to comment? Well, then, I want to be as considerate and polite as can be. So I just don't want to sit there and say, I won't even provide some sort of an answer. So I'd rather, I'd rather do that. Um, however, to be perfectly honest, if when you ask me, what is the proportional weight or the respective weight that the US is, is putting to this, if I was able to tell you everything that I know about the negotiation and everything, I'm not sure I could actually give you an answer that that is representative of the, you know, a percentage, right? I will not the hide hide the fact from you, and 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 that one is easy, and I alluded to it earlier in the meeting. Uh, flood risk management is important to that, right? I mean, look at how many people live in the basin and uh, look at the infrastructure that they have, look at the, the, the potential that this mighty Columbia River has to wreak havoc and, and flood areas, not only in the US, by the way. So of course, it's very important to them. But as, as for assigning a, 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 a precise uh, or, or, or a semi-precise weight to it, uh, I'd be hard pressed to do that. And, and, and we're probably going to have a better idea after a couple of upcoming rounds. But then again, it's difficult for us to share that until it's time to share it. Right? So I'll leave it at that. 
Thanks so much, Sylvain. So a uh, next uh, question is, will the Canadian negotiators advocate for those who lost land and a way of life behind the dams that were built in the basin? Kathy or Sylvain or any of the other panelists? Well, to, to just be truthful, I'm not sure advocating to whom and for what exactly, but what we are doing is looking at what are the issues that the communities around the basin are bringing up to us, what the interests are, and, and addressing them outside of uh, the negotiation on the CRT. As I explained uh, earlier, we have about 12 projects where we're, we're looking at how to improve certain um, uh, or mitigate certain impacts from the treaty that we can that we can address within you know that are in our own hands and so that certainly is something that we're committed to doing um, and um, and that we're going to continue to do um, as communities themselves identify what we should be working on with them. Great, thank you, Kathy. So moving on to the next question, uh, does the expanded modeling initiative examine scenarios for reservoir operations on both sides of the border or just Canada? Maybe Bill, you could speak to that uh, or, or Kathy if you're available. Um, for, for where we're at now is that the model has been set up to be able to examine uh, a range of alternative operating scenarios for the Canadian reservoirs and of course in parallel for the river reaches downstream of the reservoirs. So it is currently Canadian focused but uh, I think we see the need in the future to be able to um, do collaborative modeling with the US so we can come up with a common understanding of the impacts to to reservoirs, rivers, and ecosystems, and other values on both sides of the border, but we're not there now. We're uh, the work we're doing now is focused on the Canadian side, and I think that's a, a good starting place to get to the point where we can identify preferred collectively uh, can identify preferred operations, potential preferred operations, and then uh, ultimately get to some perhaps collaborative modeling with the US. Great, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, and there is another question on, on salmon here. I'm not sure if you would comment or, or possibly Sylvain or Kathy, but what is Canada's position on restoring salmon runs via installation of fish, fish passages on the dams or obstructions? I, I can answer that because in my earlier career, I was part of the Ministry of Environment and involved in environmental assessments with, with, with Bill. And uh, parts of some of the environmental assessments uh, required uh, the province to, to um, uh, include fish passage if and when fish were um, crossing the border or, being, or feasibly reintroduced into Canada. So on to you, Bill. Uh, well, thanks, uh, but I will bounce this because it's. I think it's specifically asking for Canada's position. Certainly within the Columbia River Salmon Restoration Initiative, we are actively examining what the options uh, are for providing fish, fish passage at currently impassable dams. And it's uh, a really important focus of our work. Okay, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a fish we have a huge department in the government of Canada full of people like that. What I will say is salmon is an issue. Things have evolved over the decades. Pacific salmon is, is, is an important issue for the federal government. And, and there are a lot of people at um, Fisheries and Oceans who, who are looking into this and, and trying to figure out you know, what is feasible or not. Um, we have a group now, uh, it was mentioned before tonight, that uh, a group that um, has 
um, fisheries and oceans uh, representatives, uh, BC uh, provincial uh, re expert representatives, uh, indigenous, the three basin indigenous nations who've signed a letter of intent and they're, and they're looking at this. The first question, and again, I'm not an expert, but the question they're looking at for now, in the future, we don't know. The main question is, we, you have to look at the feasibility of reintroducing the salmon, right? And, and um, you know, it's probably feasible, but, but we don't know, and we certainly don't know how, and, and at what cost, and at, you know, uh, you know, by doing what, right? So we're doing the things step by step. And, and now there, there's some work that is being done and there's probably gonna be more work in the future. And again, to touch a little bit on an earlier question when it talked about, are you doing modeling with the US for ecosystems? Eventually, it's obvious, even for a guy like me, that any serious work about salmon reintroduction will, will require um, transboundary work because uh, right now the salmon is blocked way before, uh, and I'm not trying to pass the buck, right? Everybody has a blame in this, but physically the salmon is, is stopped before the border, right? So obviously we can do the, all the work we want in Canada that salmon needs to go up and back down to the ocean. So if there's no going back down to the ocean in, in the US, whatever we do in Canada will, 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 not, will, be, will not have a big impact. The opposite is the same. You know, if and when the US decides we're reintroducing salmon, we're gonna do whatever we want, they, it's not likely that they will be able to do this very successfully if nothing is done on the Canadian side because the salmon needs to go up way past the Canadian dam. So we'll, we'll need, eventually there'll have to be a, a, a binational thinking on this, right? But um, for, for the time being, we're, we're, we're starting. And, and again, I was very surprised to learn, and, and a lot of you probably know that, so I don't want to sound like I'm preaching, but I was told repeatedly that the most serious issue for salmon is not always to have them go, come up through the dams, is how they go back down, right? Both in a river that where the current has been slowed down and it, it makes it difficult for the little fish to go back down and they're more, they're more um, likely to be victim of predators, right? And also when they go over the dam, uh, they don't always successfully go over the dam or through the turbine. So it's a, it's a two-way street. But anyways, uh, first things first, there's some work being done. Hopefully there'll be some other work uh, being done and, and uh, we're working with our indigenous nations, uh, indigenous Canadians, uh, indigenous nation representatives, and we'll see what comes out of phase one and then go from there. Thank you so much, Sylvain. So the next question here is, um, again, I think Kathy talked to this a bit earlier, but maybe to reiterate, when do the people of the basin get to have a say before the team makes a final decision? Yeah, I think we answered that a couple of times, Brooke. We can mm -hmm. go Okay, this great. Uh, so the next question here, um, Ms. so it's a question for you, Sylvain. Uh, is, what is your opinion on the proposal and validity of an earthen dam built just north of the 49th? This proposal will do many things such as stabilizing water levels in the Kukanusa Reservoir, protecting ecosystems and bay corrosion, providing economic benefits by way of recreation, but most importantly, to protect and control our natural resource water. Uh, you, you have made mention of many things that the U.S. are concerned with, but those same concerns are felt north of the border as well. We have seen arbitrary decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court that circumvent the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and BC Hydro. Sylvain, do you have a response to that comment and question? Oh, hold on. I'm having an issue with my video. Okay. No. I don't, and I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't care. This is an issue that has been raised and the government of BC is looking at, right? So I don't want to preempt uh, or publicly, certainly, 
what I think of this. So for, for now, I'll leave it at that. But if Kathy wants to say something up to her, but on this one, I'll leave it at that. I apologize. Um, no, I, I think, uh, and I suspect that the questioner is fully aware of what's going on um, and how, what the process is for the Kukanusa Dam. So um, we'll, we'll allow the process to unfold as I uh, explained earlier this evening. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, you too. So I'm gonna move over to the raised hands over here. We have one hand that's raised from Jerry. Uh, Jerry, I'm gonna allow you to speak. So if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, if you are still interested, there you go. Yeah, yes, I certainly am. It's Jerry Wilkie from uh, the Columbia Valley. And uh, I'm just really interested in, uh, in, in all the negotiations, how you are taking into account the uh, uh, the long the long term uh, loss of water. We're talking about water, and uh, you know the abatement of the glaciers and so forth. Are there stages? Uh, are are you talking about a stage? You know, with your models that we can do this. Or I'm just interested in 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 how that how that's playing out because it's a it's a huge issue. Obviously, uh, climate change is is uh, is right there with you on the table. I could uh, start to, to answer that and maybe Bill or Savannah or others would jump in. Um, uh, climate change is definitely has been top of mind uh, ever since we, well, even before we started talking about uh, the future of the Columbia River Treaty and uh, the, there are many, many scientists on both sides of the border that are looking at what are the predictions uh, for climate change for the Columbia Basin. Um, the good news for us anyway in, in BC is that the total inflow, uh, less a glacier melt, uh, less snow, more rain, but we're still going to continue to have a, a healthy snowpack, uh, will mean that in total over the year, uh, we'll have the same or even maybe more water. Um, that's maybe not, uh, you know, that, that may not be so true in the lower Columbia. Uh, so, um, but, uh, and Bill could, could, or Cindy could talk to this, uh, the climate change um, scenarios or baselines are being incorporated in the modeling that we're doing to, to look at the effects on all of the interests that we've been talking about uh, tonight. Yeah, Bill, Bill here, I can add, add a few things. So thank you, uh, Kathy. Uh, next point I'll make is that, you know, some of the climate change discussion needs to be, is uh, negotiations confidential, so I can't speak to that. Um, but within the ecosystem function work, and thanks to Cindy's work, uh, very much in each of the ecosystem function studies. Uh, so back up a bit. So Cindy spearheaded an effort to uh, develop kind of consensus information on likely impacts of climate change, uh, looking ahead to, you know, 30 and, and 60 years uh, scenarios. And so that summary is then considered in each of the ecosystem function studies about, okay, so here's what we, th we think would happen to a particular ecosystem value if the operations continue this way. Here's what we think would happen if the operations continue this way and we have this degree of climate change. And again, looking at different uh, emissions pathways, et cetera. So that work is being done within the ecosystem function work. And then finally, I would say that uh, we're having uh, very active discussions about how to address, um, how to meaningfully and effectively address climate change within the uh, negotiation process within the treaty. And I should say one other final, final point, which is that uh, Kathy referred to the modeling and currently considering um, two, there is work been done on both sides of the border, um, one by the River Management Joint Operations Committee on the US side, developing forecasts of inflows to reservoirs uh, on both sides of the border, um, all the way up to the headwaters. And, uh, and then there's 
somewhat parallel work being done on the Canadian side by the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. So we have two pretty robust data sets of forecasts of future stream flows and the uncertainties there. And um, so just working through what, which data sets can we use in the modeling to consider climate change impacts. Thanks. Thanks so much, you guys, appreciate it. Um, lots of questions always about how climate change is being uh, considered in these negotiations. So I appreciate those, those answers. Um, and this might be somewhat related there. And, and sorry, thank you, Jerry, who was the one to ask that question. Um, very much appreciate you doing that. Uh, so we're switching back to the Q and A's. I think um, we'll have uh, a few more uh, depending on the, how the panelists are feeling. Um, this one might be related to what was just asked, but how could open sourced environmental data between Canada and the US aid in treaty negotiations? Would anybody like to respond to that question? Can you just repeat the question? Sorry. Uh... Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how could open sourced environmental data between Canada and the US aid in treaty negotiations? So one comment I'll, I'll make in that regard is that uh, we have made a decision and a commitment within the ecosystem function uh, work to uh, to make the, all the data that's been collected for the purposes of uh, ecosystem function studies. And it's quite a vast array of information, both geospatial and other types of data. We've committed to making that publicly available through a, a data portal that's being uh, developed by Soccer College and um, the Columbia Basin Trust has agreed to fund that data portal for uh, at least for the next three years. So there is a commitment to open sourcing uh, the data that has been compiled and of course we're very open to exploring what other data sources could be brought into that uh, that soccer college data portal thanks so much bill uh, and i should also mention too that we'll add a link to that portal on our website so again visiting the columbia river treaty website uh, it's engage at gov.bc.ca or just Google Columbia River Treaty and it should come up. Uh, so we'll, we'll take maybe a couple more questions and then wrap it up for the night. Uh, so the next one is, is a, a logistical question. How frequent are the negotiations between Canada and the US? Um, we've already answered or Sylvain has already answered the question about local tribes involvement. Uh, and are there minutes of the negotiation meetings available for public viewing? Um, I think most of that's been covered, but uh, Sylvain, do you want to speak to how frequent the negotiations are? Yes, yes, yes. So hold on. We've got to calm these things. Um, historically, they've been very, very big uh, rule of thumb every two, two and a half months, uh, except of course, for the last one, which, which, which frankly, not only um, the US and BC election uh, played a role in, in, in um, uh, pushing back uh, around. Also, the, the COVID um, situation certainly has not helped, right? Um, and, and negotiations, and, and you can see that, if, if you followed the renegotiation of, um, of the Canada, US, Mexico free trade agreement, usually negotiations will happen every two months. But at one point you can have meetings in between who will touch only, it'll be like a working group. We did that earlier uh, on, on one particular issue. You know, uh, we, we call that, I can't remember the, the term, um, intercessional sessions and, and 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 you can have full-fledged sessions happening faster than that de depending on the time you need in between sessions to negotiate the issue we're facing here is um 
a lot of the, a lot of the themes and 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 the uh, situations we're dealing with in this negotiation are extremely complex. And sometimes, if you decide to address an issue in between rounds, two months is not enough, right? Uh, for example, anything that has to do with modeling, uh, even though some of these things are done with computers these days. It takes, you know, the computer does it very quickly, but what you input in the computer usually takes time before the modeling can be done. So sometimes we need more time to negotiate, right? Um, uh, and, and so I suspect we could have a round reasonably soon. There's a new administration. They're very much now engaged. The meeting yesterday with the PM is a proof of that. Uh, and then, and then, you know, we'll start again to have more regular rounds. Thanks, Sylvain. So I think we are going to wrap up soon here. I see one more hand is raised. So I will ask Ken to unmute himself and ask his question, uh, the final question for the evening. Ken, go ahead. My name is Mario Scottolero. I'm from Pembroke, BC. I'm older than dirt. I follow the Columbia River Treaty from day one. I can't tell you how disappointed I am in tonight's program. Irrigation is a big, big issue with me. I want to thank Kathy Eichenberger. I think we're lucky to have her on our negotiation team. I think she should get a lot of credit. I belong to Build the Weir Committee. We are self-funded, not have any financial interest. The petition supporting the Weir here in Kupanusa, even with COVID-19, has been locally strongly endorsed. I've written, registered, all registered letters to the Premier without any response. Phone calls to our MLA, responsible for the treaty were not returned. The Columbia River Treaty favors the US. In my opinion, monetary value to the US is in the billions. Building a weir on Kukunusa, or if the US maintains a level of 2450, is mandatory. Since 1975, the US have received all this monetary and economic benefits. In 2017, the Dallas Fell newspaper, monetary benefit to the US is $138 million. Canada receives nothing. The 85% of the water stored is in Canada, according to the latest engineering study. A major con contract in our area has suggested two locations for the rear and identified required construction materials nearby. He agrees that the suggested weir up at most cost of 400 million in the engineering study is reasonable with the possibility of coal mines ending this project to generate economic and employment for generations. Please respond. Thanks very much, Mario. And um, Mario, we it's great to hear from you. We uh, connect with you often, as you know, and as we all know. So it's great to hear from you. Uh, I would invite maybe Kathy to respond. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, Mario. Nice to hear your voice. And, uh, and thank you so much for the kudos. Um, those are things, words of, like yours keep me going and trying to do the right thing for, for the basin. Um, we know how, how important uh, the recreation levels, water levels in the Kukanusa are. And we've, we, you know, 2019 was a year that we don't want repeated. So we are, we are committed to, to, you know, addressing this, uh, rectifying the problem, finding a solution one way or the other, 
And I know you will keep us, your, our feet to the fire because you are relentless. And I, I, uh, I, I want to uh, uh, congratulate you on your upcoming uh, 94th birthday. And I wish uh, more residents had the passion and the fire that you have, a lot more would get done. Kathy, I'm just a young man, I'm only 92. Sorry, I, I aged you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and, and thanks again, Mario, for raising your concerns. Um, really important to hear them on, on public platforms like this, in addition to our engagement outside of that. So really appreciate that. And thank you, Kathy, for your response. So we're at 8.45 Pacific time here. Um, I think we're going to wrap up for the evening. Thank you so much for everybody who's who stayed along for uh, the last half hour here, especially. There was you know, about 90 people still left on this webinar, uh, which just goes to show the passion uh, and the high level of interest that many, many different people have um, from all different walks of life towards the Columbia River Treaty. So thank you once again. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody Everybody, again, that uh, a recording of this will be available on YouTube. We'll share it through our social media channels as well as on our website. And if you have any additional questions for us or um, any additional comments, please send them to Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca or you can fill out the survey that will get sent around. Uh, before we wrap up, um, I'd like to give Kathy the chance to say a few words and any of the other panelists as well, if you'd like. Kathy, yeah. go ahead. I'll, I'll just say that I've been so impressed by the attendance, by over 200 people participating, by the breadth of, of questions. And I'm really disappointed that uh, we, we couldn't tonight answer all of them. But it really, you know, we're going to... Uh, think about uh, after tonight uh, whether we should have another session and, and just carry on with the questions. Their presentations were important to give you an update on where we were at and, and all the different activities going on. And I, and I appreciate, and I was reading the chat, that people are, were interested and, and appreciate the information. Maybe we should have, in, in not too long in the future, just a Q&A to carry on this conversation because it is so important. So thanks, thanks for everybody to everybody, and I'll let other panelists um, say a few words. Thanks so much, Kathy, and I'll invite uh, any of the panelists to unmute themselves and, and share any final comments. I don't want to take any more of people's time. I just want to say thank you for for attending this meeting and giving us the opportunity to. To, uh, to share uh, some of our thoughts and hear some of your thoughts. And, uh, and um, I'll, I'll be delighted to do this again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sylvain. Go ahead, Nathan. I just think uh, the, the, the goal that we had for, for tonight is uh, uh, significantly been met just with exchanging relevant information and developing a, a better understanding of the representative uh, of of the, the indig indigenous side. It's uh, conversations like this, I think that, that will allow us to move ahead uh, with a greater level of understanding and uh, move toward that, uh, that goal of uh, reconciliation. So uh, thanks, uh, I'm very impressed with the attendance uh, this evening. Well, I, I would just, uh, um, also like to thank everybody for participating in LIMPT. And I know this was a more of a technical briefing from our team at the uh, negotiator level here and sort of giving people a sense generally about the mechanics of things and some of the issues. Um, but I would definitely welcome a, uh, another session and a higher level session where our leadership can speak more broadly about the relationship and, uh, and some of the bigger uh, more political based issues and and uh, and have that opportunity as well. Limit. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, Bill or Cindy or Linda, would you like to say any final words before we sign off for the night?
Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just thanks everybody and stay safe. And um, please keep informed on the treaty and what's going on. There's so much information on the websites that were mentioned and I really appreciate your attendance tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda. Hi folks, I wanna um, just reiterate my astonishment at the numbers and at your um, perseverance going through this. Lots of great information shared and it would be wonderful to have another session to dig into some of the topics a little bit more deeply. And uh, watch for the information about the socioeconomic work. It'll be coming to you in, in a few months. Bye-bye. Okay, I, <clears throat> I have very little to add other than thanks to all of you who, who participated uh, and the Q&A session in particular, and I would particularly welcome a follow-up session uh, more focused on the Q&A. So I think that would, uh, there's obviously much that we didn't get to in, in the questions and uh, so a good, good basis for further uh, conversation and discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. And I 100% I agree. And it sounds like we have our, our next step here. So uh, keep your eyes and ears open for the next session that we were we will hold. Thank you once again, everybody. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll stop the recording and end the session. I wish you all a safe evening. Um, keep well and uh, take care of yourselves. All the very best. <laughs>